Okay, welcome everybody. So this is the day three of the defragmentation training school. And we will see example of bi-image analysis workflows. We have the pleasure to have here with us uh, Daniel Saj from EPFL uh, Lausanne, uh, Beth Simini from Broad <coughs> Institute, uh, Anna Clem from uh, um, uh, Life uh, Lab, uh, Sweden, and Thomas Pengo from University of Minnesota. Um, so I ask uh, Daniel to start sharing his screen. Okay, thank you very much. So hello everybody. So that's um, uh, that's my my talk about zero code deep learning tools for for bioimage analysis. Uh, so my name is Daniel Sage. I'm coming from the ES EPFL Lausanne in Switzerland, and I'm working also in the biomedical imaging group, but also for the new unit which is called the EPFL Center for Imaging. Um, so today, um, I, I have a sh an introduction about the deep learning for, for bioimage analysis. Then I will make some demos and uh, yeah, many demo uh, with a very easy tools to, to use it. And I share all the material for the demos. So you can such a way that you can reproduce yourself if you want. You don't need any special tools for, for that. So if you go to this web link, so I think uh, Roku, you can maybe put it in the chat also, or is it somewhere? Uh, such a way that you can, if you want to redo the, the demo that I have done, uh, you, you can have access to the material. Uh, and then I have a, a conclusion at the end. Okay, so, um, so what kind of task we have to solve in bioimage analysis? So there is different tasks. So we, uh, and certainly when we start to speak about deep learning, we, we have to well identify the task that we have to solve. So the first one and the main, uh, okay, the first one is the classification. So we, uh, I, I give to you an image and you have to classify malignant or benign typically uh, in this case, but there is all the classification of images is very common problem in computer vision. There is also the denoising. In this case, we give an image and the output is an image of fully a better image with less noise or enhanced contrast or something that happens on the image. So we can classify that as a, a, a denoising problem. There is also something that works pretty well in deep learning is called in painting. So it's all these things where it's missing some information in the part of the image. And using the data and using specific deep learning, you try to, to fill okay, these things. Uh, with the classical tools, we speak about uh, interpolation maybe. And here I have a very, there is very cool example in the care uh, software package uh, where there is this, um, we try to, to, uh, to recover this, the axial resolution using the, the lateral res resolution. So that's a, that's a nice example of in painting. There is other, other application specifically in the, or using also deep learning, it's called virtual, uh, that I call virtual acqu acquisition, is the fact that, uh, okay, here, uh, you know that in a microscopy, you have a very often fluorescence microscopy that uh, that give very useful information, but could be toxic for the for the for the samples. So a way to uh, the so the, here we prefer to obviously to have unstained uh, acquisition, and we we try to with using a deep learning system to provide the fluorescence microscopy. So these, uh, these applications could be a little bit uh, at, the, at the limit of what it's acceptable in the, in, in the field. So there is a, also a nice paper about this application. And uh, obviously the main application that we have in, in our field is the segmentation. So segmentation, that means we want to divide the image in some part where there is object, background, or uh, different st stuff in the, in the image. There is two kinds of uh, segmentation that very important for first is uh, instance, instance segmentation where we mainly we draw a box around object. So that's, that's exactly what we see in computer vision when the, you see the car tracking, uh, or when the, the, the car, uh, the self-driving car tr try to identify the, the, the scene. So that's the instant segmentation. So we, we count, we, can, we are able to count the object, give the position and so on. And maybe also we classify the, the, the uh, the uh, rectangle, uh, the region of interest. Uh, 
And there is the, the other one, which is called segmentic segmentation. Uh, here in this case, uh, it's more a pixel classification. That means for each pixels, we give a class. So here it's a binary uh, seg semantic segmentation. So that means we give the class zero for the background and maybe one or 255 for the, for the, for the cells. So segmentic segmentation. And that's the, obviously that's the main application that we have in, the, in our field in bioimage analysis. Uh, typically to identify the cells, nuclei, and so on. So segmentic segmentation. Um, so I usually I prefer to call that like pixel classification to really point out that we, for each pixels, we assign a class. Uh, and that's exactly the, the, the demo that I will do. It's the uh, pixel classification. It's the simplest thing to, uh, to, uh, to start with the deployment. So now, uh, when we have an image uh, analysis question, uh, so usually, okay, we, we have seen that uh, many uh, deep learning systems works very well, and people uh, just say, hey, how, which, uh, which uh, tools should I use? I, I want to, to, to revamp up a little bit the story. And the first thing that you have maybe to, to start, and that's the, the tool that will uh, the other teacher will explain to you is the pix, what I call pixel-based approach. So that's really to start with, or let's say, classical method like threshold in digital filter morphological operator and so on to extract the feature. Here you have to uh, to work pretty hard to design to engineer your uh, your systems. And typically at the end, maybe you have a workflow of image analysis operation. Typically it could be a Fiji plugin or Fiji macro uh, to do this kind of, of things. And if it works, you don't need to go to the to deep learning because okay, here you have a system that works. Uh, why you will uh, try to learn something if the, the standard method works well. Another approach is to use the a physical model or model-based approach. Here, you, you, here you, you try to identify or to have a mathematical model of the image acquisition or on the uh, specimen. Uh, that's typically uh, what we do in deconvolution, super resolution, or with active contour, where we have a model of the shape. So when you have a strong model of the shape, obviously you can design an optimization program to find the model in your data. And that's, that's typically what we do with MATLAB code and everything. Uh, so it's also a very good uh, uh, approach, but obviously there is more mathematical background behind because you should uh, try to find, to, to set up your equation such a way that you, after you call a solver to solve this equation. But an image analysis, problem usually uh, if you think uh, how it works if you have an explicit model that could be a very good approach to solve a problem because you are sure that you have an optim optimal solution at the end the other approach that you can take is the machine learning or the let's say the shallow learning uh, here the, the, the idea is to um, to uncraft the, the filters. So typically you, uh, you, you, you pass your image with, uh, through a bank of filters, and then you only uh, use a classifier uh, to, uh, to classify the feature that you have to extract with, uh, that you have extracted with the, with the, the, the filter. So a classical fil uh, classifier is the random forest is the one that people use it in the soft is very nice uh, software, which is called Elastic. Uh, I don't know if, I do not remember if you have presentation of Elastic, but if you want to try Elastic, it's a very, very uh, useful software that you can, uh, uh, very, uh, with a graphical user interface that you can play with. It's very easy to, to use and give pretty good results also. So there is, um, so that's typically what we do uh, using this, uh, this kind of approach. And okay, if the first one, if the pixel-based approach do not work, so if, if you do not have an explicit model base uh, or an explicit model, and if the machine learning or the shallow learning do not work, you, are, you do not have an explicit way to, to, to set up your problem. In this case, you can go to the, to the deep learning approach 
completely based on the data. So it's here, we do not have anything to engineer. So the, we just have to prepare the data. So your, the, your goals here is to provide data. And I will explain it a little bit later, but not only the raw data, but also the annotated data, such a way that you can uh, give feed uh, a training system with these uh, two kinds of data and uh, le uh, learn an artificial neural network. So it's the deep learning approach. And uh, here, typically, you have to deal with this kind of library, which is TensorFlow, PyTorch, with, with this huge framework that we have in this field. Um, okay. Okay, uh, so uh, I will uh, introduce a little bit this, uh, this new field and the, the deeper learning. And usually it's pretty hard to, uh, to set up this kind of systems, but I will show for one specific application, very easy tools to use it without any code. That's what, that was the, the, my claim. Okay. Um, so uh, you, you see in my slide, there was two kinds of approach and that we, we have there was this engineering approach where we have to, uh, to, to design a system, uh, a human design the systems. And here it's more the learning approach where the system is not designed by a human, but it's designed from the data itself. So that's these two paradigms that we have in the image analysis. Uh, so I don't want to comment, every, comment everything here, but there is this model-based engineering approach where we have, uh, what is nice in terms of explain, explainability, the results here are, are very well explainable. So we know by math what kind of uh, output we can uh, expect. We can, have a, uh, we can analyze the error. We can track where we have a, uh, what's, what is the, the kind of error we do because we have a very explicit way, uh, processing. In the uh, data-driven uh, side, there is no explain, very, explain, very easy, easy way to explain the result. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the, the effect of the black box. And we, we provide the data, we press on the button, and we expect that it, uh, that it works. Uh, but in the opposite uh, side, the, the main <clears throat> advantage of this uh, data-driven method is that we have a strong adaptivity to the to the data. So that's uh, we don't need to uh, to ex to give to the system the rules, all the rules to detect the object. The system will guess from the data. Um, so. But at the end of the day, for, for uh, user bioimage analysis, in fact, uh, when he has a problem, he has tools. At, uh, so it's like a toolbox. You open your tools, and you, are, you have a kind of image to, a problem to solve. So you can say, I can use the watershed, the morphological operator, and so on. Or maybe there is other tools now so, uh, available for us. Using based on the deep learning, this kind of for the denoising, there is this noise to noise, and noise to void. For the instant segmentation, we have the YOLO or Starlist or, or other software like Cellpose that we, which works very well. And to, there is also a, a one which is called the UNET. So it's a, and I will explain a little bit later the, the UNET, the one that we use for the pixel classification here in this, in this talk. So, but uh, so we have two paradigms. Don't forget to, to uh, that the classical method or the model based method can work on some kind of problems. And in this, if it works, you uh, we, we have to use it for sure. And for when there is no explicit way to describe the data, describe the problem, okay, we, we can go to the deep learning using the, the, the some tools that are available now. Okay. So in the deep learning in bioimage analysis, <clears throat> so uh, so it's for, for image classification, object classification. So we can solve also object detection, image enhancements, and certainly we can solve also image segmentation. And some people start to solve also the tracking problem with the deep learning. But it's not only the, the where the, the deep learning is important for us. It's also important in bioimaging in image reconstruction. So here, typically denoising, deconvolution, registration, super resolution problems can be solved, or we can at least remove the artifact of the reconstruction uh, using the, the data itself, using the deep learning uh, things. 
But for, for both, this, uh, we need data. And when I say data, it's a lot of data. It's, you know that it's everything is based on this kind of big data. And here I put also data plus label or what, uh, so ground truth annotated data to such a way that the, the system can learn. So it's not only the raw data that's coming from the microscopes, but it's the data that a human has annotated with uh, using some tools. So that's typically what we, we do with uh, using this supervised uh, learning. So it's 99% of the, the deep learning are supervised. But there is other things uh, in, uh, in deep learning. There is also the weak supervised or self-supervised uh, that I cannot comment to them, which, which is obviously more difficult to, uh, to, uh, to train. Uh, so that's, uh, but there is people that try to, to avoid this, uh, this bottleneck, which is the, the label. And that's very often we do not have any, enough label to train. Okay, um, so I just want to, to set up the workflow in deep learning. So probably it's a reminder for, for many people, but you should know that uh, uh, we, the first step is the training. So the, where you, you have a new, when you have a new system, you have to provide the raw data and the annotated data. So if it's a pixel cl uh, classification, we provide the raw data, which is DIC or face contrast here. And we provide the label, so background in, with a, uh, black, uh, cell in white, and so on. So, but when I, okay, we, we provide a lot of data, then we train the model. So I will, uh, if you need, I will try to open a Jupyter notebook that do these kind of things. And when the, the model is trained, you, you can save your model. Then you can reuse this model to make an inference. So that's, uh, you, you take your model, you take your images and uh, using the very simple uh, stuff, you can make a, a prediction. So running the, using the model, make a prediction and you expect to have a good output. The output of the trained model, when you train, there is something that it's very important to, uh, to uh, check is the learning curve. So here's the, the training is obviously an iterative process. So iteration that we call epoch, epochs after epochs, uh, we check the uh, the error, so the difference between the predicted image and the annotated data. So, and the error should decrease. So, and we have always in machine learning two two data set: the training data set and the validation data set. So, the training data set is is used to optimize the parameter of the model. And in addition, we have another data set, which is called the validation data set, that we use to control is everything is, is working well. And when everything is uh, working well, we have a good fit when the two curves decrease uh, in, the same, uh, in the same time and with very low value. Here, it's an example of a, a, good, uh, a good training. Um, so, um, so what I do forget to mention here, the training is very, it's a very slow operation, iteration after iteration. We have many, many parameters, parameters to learn. Uh, so usually you need a very good computer. So using typically GPU. Uh, and uh, in the opposite, the in inference is a very easy stuff to do because we just, we, we have nothing to learn. So it's a one shot operation. You just, uh, provide an image, apply the model, and you have the prediction. So you can run on the on your standard laptop. And uh, I will show you a little bit of deep image just after deep image. It's a way to make an inference on the directly on image on a standard laptop using a CPU. Here, uh, I should mention there is another uh, step. Uh, which is uh, very used also, it's called the fine tuning. So uh, and sometimes it's too, uh, it's too hard to, uh, to, uh, um, to retrain from scratch because you need too much data. So we, we, we can take already a trained model. Okay. There is a, a lot of trained model for, for the, for the bioimaging problems. And we provide few data specific to our problems. 
So that's what. So we provide the model, then the few data, the raw data, and few annotated data. Then we can uh, retrain the model, and obviously it, it will be faster because uh, some part of the training is already done. Then we have a specific train model for our uh, data. So it's what we call the fine tuning. But for both uh, training and fine tuning, so the important, very uh, crucial question behind that is the, the data. So we have, you should have a very good data, curated data, label data, very, that represent very well your problem. So the main question behind that is the data. Uh, obviously, when you make a training, you, you should uh, check the validation curve and to, to validate, to have a quality control of what you, you do. Uh, usually, you have to, to choose to design a neural network. I should say nowadays, the, the, it's not anymore a question because uh, there is good uh, uh, already uh, architecture like uh, using by cell pose, TARDIS, and so on. And for the, for the pixel classification, there is this unit. So now the unit is pr pr works for, for this kind of problem very well. But obviously, there is also a cost. It's not only a cost in, uh, in money, it's also a cost in CO2 because we have to use very, uh, very powerful computer that consume a lot of electricity uh, using this kind of uh, GPU or cloud computing. And today, I will show you a Jupyter notebook that runs on cloud computing, Google Collab. And uh, very often, you need uh, an expert in IT to, to set up the computer. If you want to run on your own computer, probably you need to buy a GPU to, to install these kind of things, Pythons, or to, to access to some server to, 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 to make the training. Uh, so when you start with the, uh, the, the deep learning, maybe the first thing that you have to do is to check if somebody has a similar problem. So because okay, many things, you don't want to reinvent the wheel uh, all, the, all the time. And certainly, you don't want to annotate a lot of data if somebody has already do something which is similar. So maybe it exists some already trained model or pre-trained model. And there are, uh, there are few that solve our uh, things. Um, okay, noise to voice is not really a pre-trained model, but okay. Uh, uh, for the denoising, there is noise to void, uh, where it's here it's a little bit different because it's a self-supervised story, but it, at least it's a very good denoiser using deep learning, and you can provide your image using an already uh, pre-trained model and, and make a fine tuning to your specific uh, problem. In segmentation, there is this two nice piece of, uh, of software. One is called Stardist. The other one is CellPose. It's uh, the, 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 the provide pre-trained model that you can uh, eventually fine tune if the data is not exactly the same than, than for your problems. Uh, Stardist is very cool to detect objects in, uh, and specifically round, roundish uh, uh, shape object in very dense images. So there is an uh, interface for Python, Jupyter Notebook, or even now for Fiji, in fact. And CellPose, it's also a very good software. They, they have a lot of model, pre-trained model that you can probably direct, directly use in 2D and now also in 3D. So that's the a way to, uh, to avoid to code, to retrain something for you, uh, for your problems. And there is this uh, yellow mask CNN. Here it's more for the detection, in fact. Huh? So the detection, I mean, I mean, you want to detect object in image, so draw, draw the, uh, the rectangle uh, around the object. And uh, so now there is also another place where you can find the pre-trained models. So it's a new initiative taken by many people in the field. It's called Bio Image Model Zoo. So uh, it's a place uh, where you, you have the link to pre-train model. And it's, it's, it's the, all the, all the pre, uh, so the effort of this community is to define a model that you can share with different software. So uh, such a way that you can, uh, if, the, if the model was trained by, uh, by let's say, zero cost deep learning for microscopy, it is one. It's a one that, uh, that where we can train a, a model. You can use it in Deep Image, which is this software. In fact, you can use it in Image, or you can use it in uh, Elastic. So a model 
now it's a, it's a, okay that's an effort to standardize the, the model such a way that you can exchange a model from different platforms to 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 have better inter interoperability uh, so please uh, before to, to start visit these, uh, these places maybe uh, start this cell pose or the bioimage model zoo maybe you will find something which is similar and if it's the case you can directly use it or maybe make just a fine tuning steps in the bioimage model zoo, the, the a, a, to, to have the model on this, on this zoo, uh, the people should provide everything and the data set, the way to, to, make the, to retrain and make the fine tuning. So all the, the information are open. So, uh, so today I, I want to, to introduce two, um, uh, two things. So that's the, the zero cost, and I will make a demonstration with this, uh, this one. The, so it's called the zero cost DL for microscopy. So it's a self-explanatory uh, notebooks that runs on Google Collab. So Google Collab has the advantage that it's free. Okay, free, uh, not completely exactly because you have to provide a Gmail address, put your data on the, on the, G, uh, the Google Drive, and obviously uh, Google will uh, scan your data. That's, that's the drawback of, the, of this uh, Google Collab. Uh, and uh, we have uh, an export to the bioimage model zoo. So it's a way to train. I will start in a few minutes this, uh, this Jupyter notebook to train without any setup uh, to do. So you don't need the GPU, you, you will access to the cloud computing of Google Collab. And at the end, you can export to the, to the zoo on this zoo. Uh, then uh, I will also make a short demo of deep images. So deep images is a way to run uh, an inference in image. It's, it's a standard plugin that you can uh, use it. You take a model you take, uh, and you can just say, I, I want to apply this model on my image and uh, directly in image, which is a nice piece of software too. So maybe I will start the demos. Thanks. So what I, I provide to you is, is, the, is the link on this, uh, on this folder. So there is a Jupyter notebook and there is some data where we can, we can play with. And I have already saved a model. But okay, the, with this Jupyter notebook, we can run a training using this data. So in the data, I have this kind of things. Uh, I will open it maybe with uh, Fiji and have to open Fiji. So I should open it. Uh, yeah. So I provide a folder called demos and I provide some kind of uh, some images like that. Okay, let me see. Let's see this one. Okay, I'll open things. Okay, so the goal here is to segment this kind of cells. So I should say that it's pretty difficult. Huh? Uh, even me, I am okay. Consider that uh, I I am a specialist of image analysis. If I have to segment this kind of uh, cells. Uh, without using deep learning, so uh, I will be uh, a little bit confused. Okay, so some people come in my office and say, "Hey, I want to segment that." Uh, then you see that's pretty, it's pretty tough. Huh? That's to segment that. If you use a, obviously a threshold, it will not work. Uh, that there is no hope. That obviously, the gray level is the same. So probably you can use a, a sort of bandpass filter, but I'm not completely sure that we. No, I, I have to try a little bit. Even using a, let's say a sort of filtering to uh, to improve to enhance like a pass, maybe a variance, local variance will give the will isolate the, the flat area and the, the area, area with the uh, so you will see that it's pretty it's pretty tough. There is I think there is no hope to solve this problem without uh, deep learning. So. Uh, but in this case, I'm very lucky. We are very lucky because some people have, sorry, uh, some people it's, uh, have annotated the data. So what they have done. Okay. They have put 
sorry, it's, they have put zero and one in the cell. So one, you do not see it because uh, uh, we should modify the brightness and the contrast. So I, uh, you see that I have annotated data. So that's something that uh, uh, I have. So for each of the image, I have the annotated data. So pe when people have outlined with a mouse the cells, so now I have, I, I, I have this material to train the systems. So it's what, what I can do. So uh, there. So I will start the Jupyter notebook. So, uh, so what I use, it's a, a slightly modified version of the one that you find on the zero cost uh, DL for microscopy, but it's a good place to, to, to go and to visit at this place. It's called zero cost. DL for microscopy. So uh, maybe when you have to train something, it's a really good place to, to go. There is a wiki here where they explain how to train. Uh, they, they provide a lot of like studies, denoising, uh, cell pose. And I use this one here, a modified version of this one, which is called the UNET. The UNET, so it's for here it's for pixel segmentation. Yeah, I used a modified version of this one so that you can open in Google Collab. Yeah. So now, okay, here I am. So I have, uh, when I right click on these, uh, these things, I open with Google uh, Collab. So obviously I should have the data on uh, a drive, a Google Drive. Huh? That's, uh, that's uh, on, on my Google Drive. And then I can start uh, step by step. To run this cell, so the first point, the first so step is to uh, it's a little bit slow, is to install all the dependencies. Here it's, uh, we use the library which is called TensorFlow 1.15. It's a pretty old version of TensorFlow. Uh, so we install. Takes a little bit times, but uh, you see that the I will clean it. So, so to, to run the training, what I have to do is to run all this kind, this kind of cells. So the first one is the installation of, the, of some dependencies and library. The second one is to connect with the Google Collab, so make the connection with the Google Collab. So we will give the authorization to, uh, to Google to scan the data here. Then we will load the data. So including the, the source and the target, the target is the label data. Then we have the, something that I did not mention, data augmentation, so to provide more data. Then we will create the unit, the networks that we, uh, that we will use. And then the, the next step is the training. So we, we will be able to start the training here. So by clicking on this, all these buttons one by one, uh, we will observe also the, uh, the plot, uh, the learning curve, and we have the exportation of the, at the end, you can export in the bio model uh, image. So by using these things, so is it done? Not, uh, it's a little bit time. So um, you will see that here, when I check the GPU, <gasps> That's my case. I too, I use too much the <laughs> I use too much the, the the GPU with Google Collab. So the Google Collabs with this account, they they do not give me access to GPU. Today I will not have a GPU, so I will be uh, I won't be able to to train. But I just want to to continue a little bit. Uh, so I connect to my uh, data. So here I use okay my uh, professional account. So authorize so I give the, the permission to, to, to Google to, to go to my data, to this specific data, I hope so. And what happens here when I connect? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. So my Gmail, my G drive is connected to the, to the Google Drive. So there I can go to the, to the data. So I store the data somewhere in the, yes. Okay. So they, here, so the good way, so I, I, I should provide in this uh, Jupyter notebook, I should provide a, a folder containing uh, four folder inside the training uh, target, the training source, raw data for the, for the training, the training target, uh, that's the label data, 
then I should provide the test source only for the at the completely at the end, which is not used for the, for the training and test target. So it's so here I will copy so copy and put the data set path there. Paste. So I copy paste the, the things um, and I can run. So in this uh, in my data set, I have 72 uh, data for the training source. 72 images for the for, as target. Obviously, sh I should have the, the same number, and I have 27 uh, images for the for the test for the quality control at the end. So the size of the image is 512 by 512, and I can start to read this image. So here it could be a TIFF image or PNG, PNG images, and the system start to read. So it, uh, it load the, the the image in memory, so loading the source and the target images. Uh, so and you understand that in the source images, I have a raw data, eight bit images. And in the target, I have an image with zero and one only. Zero in the background, one in the cell. That's it. That's my uh, label image. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, here I list all the images that I have in the data. I can display uh, uh, one of the data, so that's uh, an example of the data that uh, we have in this, in this data set. So you see that will be uh, the, the zero and one and the raw data, the target. Then there's this step that we can uh, do or not. Uh, I will uh, skip it here because I do not have GPU, but it's the data augmentation. So uh, to when usually we do not have enough data, so we, we, we rotate a little bit the, the raw data and the target image to increase the, the variability uh, or at least the geometrical variability of the data. And then uh, here I will uh, define now the model itself. So I should uh, give a name. Uh, uh, so it's, it's for a course and uh, a pass and a, a test. And here we have one important parameter that's the number of epochs. So obviously, I can usually for this kind of data, probably you need 100 epochs, something like that. We take around 10 or 20 minutes if you have a GPU. Uh, for me, it will never end without the GPU. Uh, and that's the other parameter is more advanced. So you can just give the default value, that's it. And um, so after you can uh, define the, 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 the hyperparameter, fine tuning, we do not have any uh, something to do here because uh, we do not provide a pre-trained model. We can now prepare the model. Ah, there is no. Ah, uh, because I, I, for, I should run this cell, sorry. Okay, it's recommended, but it's not only recommended, it's mandatory <laughs> to do it. So here you see that's the, the uh, okay, it's, it's very, very slow because I do not have GPU, it should be uh, faster, but uh, we observe what we call the error, the loss function which uh, now will start from 0 0.9, so it's pretty bad value because we, we start from a, an initial point. Then we should see that the T number decrease and decrease epochs after epochs. So obviously I have stored already a model somewhere. I'll show you what happens if I run with a GPU. So I should go there. I provide a, a, a model that I that I have trained with this uh, stuff. So it was in demo, yes. Uh, so I do not have the, the, the curve. Okay, let's say that now. Uh, okay, imagine that uh, I have a GPU. I run uh, one uh, one hundred and twenty uh, epochs, so at, uh, around ten minutes. At the end, uh, I am able to observe the curve and uh, to save the, the model in the bio image model format. So it will give to me uh, a zip file that with, this, with, with the name that I give to the, to the systems. And then I can uh, download, uh, yeah, download the, <laughs> the, the model from Google Drive to ImageJ. 
So to use it directly to make a prediction, to make with the data that it was not seen. So I, or Fiji. So after what I have done, so first, you all know image Fiji, I, I assume that's okay. Yes. Yeah, okay, so Fiji is there. So I have installed using the update of Fiji, something which, which is called deep image. So I have something called deep image. So it, you, you have to use the updater of Fiji, uh, check the box deep image. So now you have something to make a prediction on your computer, not using Google Drive, on your laptop. I'm running here on my laptop. Uh, I'm using a Java Java based program. So I have saved this model. Uh, the model was here. So that's the saved model. So save using the Jupyter Notebook. So now I can try to use it. So to use it, I should provide an image. Let's say that I provide an image. <laughs> Uh, I provide one of the test image. So this image was not used for the training. So now I can just use it like that. So deep image run. So to make a prediction. So here I have this window. I can load um, the model, which is, uh, let's say, this one. So it was. Uh, it was trained with 120 epochs. Okay, I will I, I will do the pre-processing, so it, that's a mandatory step to to uh, normalize the image. But I will not do the, the post-processing just to just have the inference because obviously there is always this pre-processing inference using the deep learning and post-processing. Then I can click on OK there here. And I expect to have an output. So that's the app, that's the output of the network. So I provide this image, and I can obtain this kind of uh, pixel segmentation. So it's a probability map. So here, when I move the, my mouse in the black area, you see that the value is very close to to, to zero, zero dot zero three, and so on. When I move the, the mouse on the white area, I have something close to one. So the probability of this pixel, let's say this pixel has a probability of 0 0.987% to, to, to belong to, uh, to the cell. And this pixel has a very low probability to belong to the cell. Okay, so if I want to uh, uh, we can make a max of the probabilities just here at threshold. So we should put the threshold at 0 0.5. Let's say if we put from 0 to, okay, we see we have now a binary image apply. To mask. So that's the mask. Uh, zero. So I should invert this image. I don't know why. Okay, invert. Uh, invert crypto table. Oops. Okay, yeah. So now I have 255 here and zero here. So it's the binary mask, but, uh, the most probable, the most probable uh, pixel belong to the to the to the cell or to the background. So obviously, if you want to have something, uh, uh, <clears throat> it's not completely perfect. And you see, there is some kind of F effect. But to obtain this, this result with classical method is pretty it's pretty difficult. You are deciding the size of the patches, right? A five twelve by five twelve. Anything special yes. in your uh, laptop? I mean, uh, in your computer? Uh, is it a normal computer? Limited amount of RAM? Okay, uh, five twelve by five twelve is, is a very common uh, settings. Uh, obviously, if you have larger image, you, you can do with uh, one. Uh, uh, yeah, 1,000 or 2,000 by 2,000. Uh, around 2,000 by 2,000, you start to have some kind of problem with the memory of the GPU in uh, in Google Colab. So it should not be too large at some point. And after, if it's too small, uh, if, let's say if you take a 32 by 32, you take a very, very small pa uh, patches. The problem here, that's the to take the decision, you will not have enough context. 
and that's that's also uh, penalize the robustness of your of your systems so that's uh, something that you have to deal with the size so 256 to 256 is also a, a good size or something like that it should be uh, due to the unit structure that i do not have time to explain you should be able to divide uh, usually by 32 so it's uh, uh, because there is this scale we divide the image by two by two by two by two at least four or five times so you should uh, so the size is determined by this kind of settings yes can you fine tune a train model using only the graphical user interface or uh, deep image a or deep image a no. No, deep image just for no. inference and pre-train models. No, yes, uh, deep image is only for inference. If there is no possibility to train, is mainly due to the fact that the the the, the most common uh, package, which is PyTorch and TensorFlow, are written are accessible by Python mainly. All the the tools for the for the optimization for the training. Are provided in Python, and in my, as far as know, there is no way using a user interface. Maybe now with Napari, there is some connection, but I think, yeah, that's uh, the only way that I know is to uh, the, the most easier way to to do it is to use the zero cost the DL for which is a Jupyter model. But it's uh, you need a, spe a specific version of TensorFlow, which is the TensorFlow uh, for Java, because uh, Fiji okay. uh, are in Java. And this one comes with when you install uh, DeepImage, you download also the TensorFlow Java. Even you can just visit the the BioImage model zoo, choose a model which is uh, makes sense for you. I don't know what is one. But, uh, uh, you you have similar images. You want to obtain the membranes, so just install this model, and you can use it. There is nothing to install. Everything is uh, is uh, uh, out of the box uh, like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have prepared something. Okay. I have another another model which is called Blaya Blast. Uh, this one, perfect. Okay. Okay, this one is another segmentation problem. So uh, if I use deep image, I have to train a, a network to to uh, to do these things. So where it is? Uh, it's not clear. Ah, yeah, this one. This sixty. Okay. Okay, that's not clear. Okay, perfect. Uh, we have an input image and we have an output image, which uh, which seems okay. So now what I have done is start to interpret a little bit the result. So I, I have prepared an image that I, that I call uh, attacks. So what I have uh, do is to, I have take these images and uh, I modify a little bit the input image, add in some, I, I copy, you see that I, I take this part of the image uh, and I copy there, and I add some kind of noise. There I add a speckle noise, Gaussian noise. Here I blur a little bit the image, blur also. Here I create a circles only with noise, there is no data. Here I draw by myself uh, uh, around a circle and to, sim to imitate the uh, cells. Here I do all the modification. Then we can. Uh, Check what happens as output. So it's really to to uh, to test a little bit, and uh, it's that's something that you have really to do uh, to uh, to check the output of uh, of the network in different condition. Let's say I use this one, Glio. Okay, and here that we can start to see. Okay. It seems where the, the cells were well uh, trained or learned. Okay, the result is exactly the same. So at least there is no uh, uh, no diffusion of the bad stuff. But here you see, if I add some speckle noise on the data, the the systems do not see anything. So you just forget. You see, it seems background, but it's not background. It's a cell post noise. 
And here, when we have Gaussian noise, what we see it's a, it's a square. So that's completely uh, that's completely crazy. So the, the system we can say that he hallucinate. Huh? He has uh, he has very bad uh, behavior. And in all the opposite uh, sense, if I am a little bit out of focus, I can consider that it's not so bad as a result when we are out of focus. For these models, huh? for this kind of all, for the data that I have used, so it, I can conclude for for this specific case with the data that I use for the training, with the uh, with the model that I use. Uh, blowing or out of focus, the system will be robust, but it, it's not robust at all when we have a noise. And here, okay, a little bit more dangerous. I do not have any cells, just noise, and we start to see some kind of cells, which is bad also. Or I, if I invent a shape that looks like a, a cells, he gets also something. So that you see that the kind of thing that you can add. Okay, so typically, if I want now to, uh, that's a question for, for you. <laughs> if, I, if I want to, uh, uh, to detect the cells, even in this condition, what should I do? Yeah, uh, take the, the model that I have and add this kind, many examples of this, uh, these images with this kind of noise in the training. So we start the training and obviously it will, be, it will work better. We can hope. So that's always the, the, the things. So this, this kind of uh, patches was never seen by the system during the training, obviously it cannot work. So that's a, there was no miracle. So that's, a, that's a, so what you are able to do to, to segment is the data that you have seen during the training, not, not the other one. Okay, that's uh, the message that I have to, to give. Typically, in segmentation, we use a lot of this Jackar index, which is called also the index of a union. So I, it's a metric to, to check it. But uh, in image, you, if, so you provide two images and you can compute a certain number of metrics. Yeah, just to repeat about fine tuning of the model, you say that one has to go through the zero cost notebook to, yeah. to do fine tuning, right? Uh, yes, yeah, yes. Thanks. There is a step. So, in fact, it's it's very similar to train. Huh? You go to the again to the. So you see how long is it? <laughs> it's still running on CPU. Um, uh, here, if so, you have to provide the, the the same way. You have to provide the data, but only few data in this case. And then at some point, you say, "Hey, I have a pre. I want to use a pre-trained model." So you check this box, provide your models. And, and make the training. There is just it is a step to do if you want to make fine tuning. So regarding some application, like for example, the one when you deal with the very noisy images or um, some application where you have trained your model with what exists already for science, do you think there is the risk that applying deep learning uh, new things in science may not be discovered because the, the model has been trained on existing data and is not, uh, let's say, trained on something new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the, the risk exists. Huh? That's for sure. <laughs> uh, so here, it's really the 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 ethics of the of the people or the the, the of the scientists. If, in fact, it's it's uh, now. Before uh, okay, before the deep learning. So you, when you write a, an automatic system, so you, you check all the all the point, and you you have something. You write a code, and you are you are confident that the people that write the code is uh, is fine, and uh, you have a nice code. Now you you place your your confidence to the people that prepare the data. In fact, the guy that prepare the data, the scientist that prepare the data should be uh, should do a very good work to cover all the kind of aspect that you can uh, imagine in, in your um, in your application so so you would say you in the field have huge power huge responsibilities right yeah that, that's a huge in fact it's a huge responsibility and probably it seems and it's a huge responsibility and it's completely hidden it's not a, we see, okay, we have data, that's okay, that's fine, but it's not enough. We should, uh, okay, uh, validation could help to uh, give a sort of answer, but it's not the, uh, the distribution of the data, the viability of the data is really important. And certainly, 
for the risk to miss uh, something which is never seen now. It's huge, in fact, in the empty space sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you for ending on these uh, philosophical notes. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so I thank you once again for the tutorial and the lesson. Um, yeah. And now we can switch to the second part. So, uh, yeah, well, well, I mean, you know that this session will be about a set profiler and uh, this will be to be a set of, to run set profiler on the cloud. And the honor to present here the, the set profiler software in the beginning, and then you see that um, I guess most of you have heard of a cell profiler and have probably also already used it. And uh, if not, then this is your chance to try it out basically and to get into it. So it's a free and open software. It runs on Windows, Windows, Mac and Linux. And then you can see it's super highly cited. And um, I, I maybe I can also add from kind of as a personal note that so we, I work at the you know, bio image analysis facility in uh, Sweden, and then we also really use it a lot in in uh, user projects and, and yeah. And so because it's very good for high content screening, uh, I guess it's also used to many pharma companies. And you can see here, t like uh, top pharma companies using it and. Maybe I assume most of you have heard of Cell Profiler, Cell Profiler Analyst, for example. I had learned a bit later. And um, so Cell Profiler is really good for like workflows, image analysis workflows, uh, quantification of like really a big batch of images. And then the Cell Profiler Analyst is when you have run your Cell Profiler Analyst, a uh, Cell Profiler pipeline, then you can take the output and uh, Use the set profile analyst to kind of look at your data, so explore your data really interactively, and but not also only look at the data, but then also use like machine learning to classify, for example, uh, things or to plot um, values, and then all this, of course, every time you can go back to the original image and look at the, really the data where the numbers come from, and that's I think super important. I guess that's why you have like these two steps, like step profile to extract the parameters. And then if, um, of course, then when you extract the parameters with step profile, you can use all, like all kinds of software, but step profile analysis is very good to, to explore it. And the interface is like that you see on the left, basically the workflow that you're building. And then, so meaning, let's say you want you have images with three channels, and then what? Well, you have some images, and you want to crop something out of it, and then you want to um, identify, let's say, nuclei and so on, and measure stuff. Then, like this is your workflow, and you would build here. Uh, you would see kind of add modules and see your modules that you have in your workflow on the left side, and then um, this is also called the pipeline panel, and then. On the right side, what you would get is for each of these modules, you get a settings panel. So you see like a description of what is happening in your in your module, and then also then of course the like where you really set what this module should do. So for example, here in this first one where you load the images, you can see then which images are loaded in cell profiler, and should they all be read or should only I don't know a certain with a certain uh, filled after applying a certain filter be read. And then you can also see here this, so you have already some um, information also here, and then you get a complete module help um, when you click here. And actually here in this little window, you can write your own uh, documentation of and describing what you want to do. And then, so, the idea of uh, this interface is that you basically have a test mode to uh, test your workflow or to build and test your workflow to set your parameters. So you go into the test mode and then you would also set an output folder. So when you run your workflow, where should like the, the measurements be saved and where should your control images that you might want to create be saved. And this you could set in this output settings. And then once you're very happy with your pipeline, with your parameters that you interactively set up, you can analyze your images, meaning you'll run over all the images that you have in your folder. 
and uh, is for example now in, like a bit like a zoom in into like this one workflow here that, that apparently here the first step is like after loading the images here which are kind of the default modules to crop an image and then here you would basically set the parameters okay here you want to crop it as a, in a rectangle and so on in image position and then what you can do is to uh, like move uh, modules up and down so like in these ones you would add modules you would remove modules but also kind of move, move modules in the workflow and then um, this little triangle is uh, you can press it to run then this module and you can also um, press here to click to your different modules in your workflow and then there are quite there are a lot of symbols which are good to of course to know so uh, this little check mark is uh, will it be executed or not executed so you can for example test something out and then say oh no okay i want to run all my workflow without this mo one step to uh, yeah this is kind of to control what you're doing and for testing is also super helpful that you have this uh, pause um, function so you can uh, activate it and then press run here and then it will run everything until uh, that pause symbol that's quite nice because then you don't need to step uh, like step 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 to all the steps workflow steps and then also especially when you're testing your workflow you want to see the output of every step and for that you have these little eyes when you open it you will get uh, the output so for example here you would get then a cropped uh, you would get the input and also the crop version, I assume at least. <laughs> and then uh, like when you, of course, once you have set this very often, you probably want to close the eyes if you then run it over like 100 images. And then also very, uh, it's very good to pay attention on the kind of whether there's an error or not. So there's this little red cross or the, cross uh, symbol error symbol here and then uh, when you actually hover over you also already see an information error message of what uh, could be wrong so and then usually of course you go to that one and uh, set the parameters and then there's also a warning sign so um, that uh, for example here like when you that just is not a real error. And I guess the most typical warning in Cell Profiler is um, that when you are in the test mode, no data will be exported to a spreadsheet. And that would be also then written when you hover over this little uh, yeah, warning sign. And um, yeah, so there's a workspace viewer. Then, and so, I, yeah, this is for yeah looking at your workspace. I guess that's, and then also um, ah, this is also like of course when you set up your pipeline, then you test it. So automatically it tests on the first image, and you can step it then to the next image set. And that's of course very important because you want to know or you want to make sure that your pipeline works not only on one image but on a few images you would usually test it before you then run it on like all your images and you can also somewhere like randomly pick an image to test it and so once you are really happy then you would exit the test board and then um, run it yeah and then this is actually i don't <laughs> well to this slide here, basically, there is a so because you have a workflow, right? And then you do something with the image. Let's say you crop it, and then you do something with the cropped image, for example, identifying some objects, primary objects. And then it's very nice to know, like, um, like which are input, which output flows where. And then there is this uh, trace input outputs. So, uh, like, um, so you can see. What you like, yeah. What feeds into and out from from every module, super nice. Good. And then, so what kind of modules are there? There are 
really a lot of modules to explore. And um, so, of course, some are needed and they are like nicely sorted in categories and some are more needed for, um, yeah, of course, for loading the data, saving the data, then um, image processing, so could be some filtering, um, then uh, object processing is also really like uh, getting the object at uh, first place and then maybe making it a bit bigger, like we are look like segmentation. And then measurements, yeah, there, uh, you, like, of course, you want to then measure whatever you have then segmented. So that could or can also be measurements of the entire image. And um, so there are really many, many modules, and it's really worth exploring it, checking with the module help, also, of course, online, and to see what these modules are doing. And you can, if you, of course, don't know, where the module is sorted to in this category, you can either just click on this all or also search for a function if you don't, if you just want to explore whether something, if you have in mind exists. Mm. Then to um, look at the images in Sepulfiler, what you do it in, so you, can, you can, for example, click on, or you get this output and then when you have such a figure window, they have uh, additional menus. And so some one is to like really like zoom in and uh, move around and uh, go reset that. And um, then what you can also do is to uh, measure something and it's in the next step. But um, also, of course, important is like where are you located, like the X and Y position of wherever your cursor is, like so that would then change, of course. And then you have uh, intensity measurements of your pixels. And um, yeah, I guess if you have never seen several, then maybe it's a bit worth worth noting that intensities are always expressed as uh, between zero and one, with one being the maximum possible value of your bit depth. And then you can measure um, lengths. So for example, it's always good to know what, what dimensions are you working with, like how big are the objects that you want to segment, and then you can simply just measure that. Usually the workflow would be to set up um, your modules, to play around, to test it on a few images. And then, of course, if you have like 100, 1000, 10,000 of images, you cannot test them, test it for all. But like, of course, what you should uh, ask yourself is, okay, you test it on a few images and then do you agree um, on, like, do you agree that the segmentation works? Like in general, that your workflow works and gives you the segmentation for most of your objects? And um, then, of course, it will need, it will never give you really perfect results because that's how biology is. Like you, you have cells that are too clustered and so on. And then um, you would you kind of need to check whether, uh, like, the so there should be no condition where the workflow fails in comparison then to, to other conditions. That's especially in this like, um, so that relates to are the nuclei, for example, well segmented in terms of like, are all nuclei that you want to catch, like also the dimmer ones, are they, uh, are they segmented? But it also means like, are they in one piece or in the, are they in several pieces or are they not? And then, like, these are then the parameters that you would usually play with. Like, you would play with the parameters to get this right. And then, um, as, yeah, you will always have some errors. And then it's important that if you have, like, the different mutants or if you have the different treatments, um, that, like, the error rates are more or less the same for about all the conditions. Good. Um, so where can you get more information? Or like if you say, okay, that I, I would like to do that, but it doesn't exist in Sepulfer, then, um, uh, then of course you can search for more help. And you can, for example, also post it on the forum, on the active forum. 
english.sc and um, if you know that it exists in imagej there's a run imagej macro module and then um, you can yeah you can run imagej macros within separator and then you can also try to write your own um, like plugins to say in the, in the in Profiler and there are templates and videos how to do this. And also if you are like a more advanced uh, image analyst, then of course that can help you to make analysis available to users who are not so, not so proficient in programming. Mm. Good. And so we are here, to, like of course, to see how Profiler can run on a cloud and like that, of course, works then in the direction of uh, what to do with large image image sets. And uh, you can easily have large image sets, especially if you do like this high content screening kind of analysis. And um, let's say if you have only a few images and a few could be like a few hundred images, then you're very fine to run it still on your local machine. And um, and then, like what Cell Profiler does, it is automatically uh, multi-threading the 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 analysis, so you can see kind of how it act, like opens up uh, and like different processes and uh, depending on your on your CPUs. And then, if you have like between something like tens and thousands, or oh no, like if you have a, between hundreds and tens of thousands then what you uh, want to do is of course to to move it away from your local machine and then what you could, can do is uh, and like run it on a cluster and that's usually like a you can contact the local system admin and that helps you to to uh, set it up and then you can also uh, use docker and that is what you will also hear about more in this session. And then if you then really have many images, many, many images, then um, of course you would consider more like cloud processing. And then also here you will he hear uh, more about that. I showed you already that, okay, you can uh, input uh, files in like just in this image modules, I don't know whether you remember, but basically you can also, for example, just drag and drop files, and then, um, but um, what you can do is to um, say it should batch files together, meaning kind of processes in 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 as one batch, and that. Um, you can also do in the set profiler. So there's this create batch files modules, and also this, uh, yeah, it's well, uh, so it's it's easy to do. So you you would uh, create this module and say, um, like these are the batches that you want like to have, and you copy basically the structure that you have on the local machine, and then you should have like the same structure on the cluster. And basically, this is an information file that is then created, an H5 file that then like um, it can be moved to the cluster and can give the cluster the information of where your batch files are located. Just to ask about the the way you you set the the cell profile pipeline to run on the cluster. I see this module appears at the end of your pipeline. So this module, just to repeat, will actually only create a file that contains um that tells the cluster how the the file are organized or is actually duplicating the data set that you have as a h5 file uh yeah it's it's just giving uh, the cluster a pointer so that your data needs to be organized in the same way on the cluster as it is um, on your local copy of the data um, otherwise, the file would just be really too big to sort of practically move around. Okay, so it will be very, uh, very small as as file compared to the huge data set that we want to analyze. Yeah. Okay. Cell Great. Profiler never actually stores images inside of it. Um, 
it will store either just the pipeline information or it will store pipelines and pointers to images, but it never actually stores images. And it's, again, because then if you put tens or hundreds of gigabytes of images into it and you wanted to share your workflow with somebody else, it would be tens or hundreds of gigabytes. Okay, thank you. I think the only thing that, that I will just sort of mention about Cell Profiler is I think um, the, the reason that Cell Profiler has lasted as long as it has is um, the folks who are outlined in blue here are professional software engineers who have contributed to the code base over the years, but there's also these folks in green who are biologists. Um, and there's been a lot of biologist input to Cell Profiler over the years. So um, uh, while we have sort of the benefit of having people who know how to write excellent, really performant code, um, sort of helping us make the tool better, we try and make sure that particularly things like the documentation are all written by biologists so that they are more approachable to somebody who doesn't have a degree in computer science, doesn't spend all of their time thinking about computational image analysis. Um, the goal of Cell Profiler when it was originally created was just to essentially um, have something where you could run the same analysis on lots of images without needing to learn to code, um, something which is still tricky in a lot of tools like, for example, ImageJ and Fiji, unless you're comfortable writing scripts. And if you're comfortable writing scripts, scripts are great. Um, scripts are incredibly useful, um, and it's definitely a skill I recommend everybody work on picking up at least a little bit but we didn't want it to be mandatory in order to sort of do good image analysis. And so this idea of a workflow tool is what um, Anne and Ray, who are the original two authors set out to do. So again, Anna gave an outstanding overview of sort of what Cell Profiler is um, in terms of, you know, why you might wanna use it, how you might wanna sort of configure a pipeline. Um, almost always you'll be configuring a pipeline locally on your own machine with sort of local copies of the images so that you can sort of turn all the dob knobs and dials and sort of see how things change. But if you've got hundreds or millions, hundreds of thousands or millions of images, which in our group is not that infrequent of, a, of an outcome, um, you probably don't want to run that on your laptop. And so Cell Profiler is designed to allow you to have inter an interactive mode, but then be able to apply the workflow that you've created somewhere else headlessly. And by headlessly, I just mean not showing the GUI to you. So you can run Cell Profiler headlessly even on your local computer. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but the idea of just no longer having to sort of use, have, make the overhead of sort of actually creating the GUI and running that, um, and so that we can run it, you know, either more performantly on your local machine or run it somewhere where we're not using a GUI like the cluster. Um, so most of the things I'm going to actually sort of get to towards the end of this are wrappers around you yourself having to interact with the cell profiler command line. Um, because in general, we try and look for things where um, we can sort of obscure the code or put the code behind a GUI that makes it make more sense and be more approachable to people who are not used to using the command line. Um, but that being said, um, it's valuable to understand the information that Cell Profiler needs for a command line command, because that's the information that ultimately, no matter what wrapper you're using, is going to have to be put into Cell Profiler in some fashion. Um, and so the important thing of sort of the next several slides is not that you memorize this command, but just that you sort of understand the sorts of information that are needed for a headless run so that whatever wrapper you choose to use, um, you understand what it's doing. So the first part of a cell profiler headless command is just telling your computer that you would want, you want to run cell profiler. Um, this might look a few different ways. Um, if you are running with cell profiler that's installed in Python on your machine, um, cell profiler runs on um, Python 3.8 or 3.9 as of the moment. Um, that might look like cell, just the command cell profiler or python-m cell profiler or python3-m cell profiler. It will depend on how you've aliased Python in your system. Um, so just try one of these <laughs> until one of them works. Um, but one of these should work depending on exactly how you've um, aliased your various Python things on your local machine. Um, but you don't have to use Cell Profiler installed from Python. Um, it can have advantages because you have um, access to um, the latest sort of code upgrades. Um, and you can also then use um, plugin tools that require extra dependencies. So for example, we have um, plugins that allow you to run CellPose or Stardust in Cell Profiler. 
Um, but those you need to be running cell profiler installed in Python. We can't include them in the main sort of downloadable program because it makes installation for end users way harder. Um, and we'd rather um, make it so that everybody can at least install some version of cell profiler. Um, so if you are running uh, cellprofiler.exe on a Windows machine that you downloaded from our website, um, you can replace this cell profiler here with this command. If you are running it on a Mac and you downloaded the executable from, uh, from, uh, from our website, it will look something like this. Um, you can, uh, in most terminals on, uh, on Mac and Windows, you can just drag and drop the actual executable file into the terminals. If you're worried about having to type all of this out, um, you can just actually drag and drop it in. It's a lot more efficient, and then you don't have to worry about typos. The next part you don't really need to worry about. There are some flags that Cell Profiler wants to see in order to run headless. Um, if you are running a headless command locally, you need to know this, but if you're running a wrapper, you don't. Um, the next thing Cell Profiler needs is a pipeline. It needs to know what is the analysis that you want it to run. Um, so if you have made a um, batch file with create batch files, you can use your pipeline that, that you made that is included in that .h5 file that was made with create batch files. Um, and it can also be um, a cppipe text file. Um, so uh, recall that um, cppipe is just sort of a flat text file that has just the steps of the pipeline in it, but nothing else. Um, cppproj has the steps of the pipeline as well as the pointers to the files. Um, and because you might be later telling it which files to run, uh, using this sort of file format causes problems. So we recommend that it's either sort of the plain text file or a batch file that's been specifically designed to run cell profiler like this. Where do you want the output to go? Um, so um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you want to know where to pick up your, your files later. Um, but one sort of note, in, in your cell profiler pipeline, you can, in a lot of the different exporting modules, things where you're saving images or saving masks of objects or, or saving quantitative data, you can usually override um, what the default output folder is going to be and say, I want it to go to a specific place. Um, if you do that, and then you are moving your workflow onto a cluster or into the cloud, probably the exact folder that you specified that you want to look at is not there on your cluster or on your cloud. Um, so Cell Profiler allows you to just, for all of these modules, say, I want to use the default output folder, which then at runtime you can set um, it in the command in some location that you know will be there when you're going to run in your, uh, on your headless application. The next thing that Cell Profiler needs to know is what files are going to be put into Cell Profiler. Um, and this is probably the most complicated part. And so um, I need to take a few minutes to sort of go through um, how data is actually put into Cell Profiler in the first place. Um, this is nobody's favorite part of interacting with Cell Profiler, but it's really crucial to getting your pipeline working the way you want it to. Um, so the major way that most people will try and get data into Cell Profiler is through what we call the input modules. Um, and the goal here is not for you to sort of read this every line of text on this slide, but briefly there are four of them. Um, images, metadata, names and types, and groups. Um, images is pretty self-explanatory. You put images in. Metadata, if you want to extract any metadata from your file name or your folder name or from the, the file headers, if you have, say, a, a um, a file that's a container file from a proprietary format, um, you can use that to associate pieces of metadata with the individual images. So say I have a time-lapse movie and I want to say, and the way my data is structured is all of the time points of my time-lapse movie are in one file. Um, I can both sort of say the name of the file is the name of my movie um, or is what Cell Profiler should call name of my movie, and that each time point um, can be extracted from within it. And so there are 20 time points, for example. Um, in names and types, you tell Cell Profiler essentially what does your experiment look like. Um, there are probably as many kinds of microscopy experiments as there are microscopists. 
Um, and so there is some information you need to sub tell Cell Profiler here. Um, are you working in 2D or are you working in 3D? Do you have one channel? Do you have an RGB image? Do you have many um, individual channels? Um, you can in theory support as many channels as you want. I think my personal best is 50 something channels um, going into Cell Profiler. Um, but you need to tell Cell Profiler how to understand your data. Um, usually whenever you write software, the trade-off is between um, flexibility and ease of use. Um, and in most cases in Cell Profiler, we've gone towards sort of flexibility and being able to support lots of use cases, but it means that then you have to specify what your use case is going to be. Um, and I've bolded the groups module here, um, even though it's actually usually optional um, in Cell Profiler. And in fact, it is optional even if you're running headless, but it can be really helpful. Um, and the reason I say that is because groups tell Cell Profiler which data has to be processed together. Um, so if I just have data from a high content screen and each individual image is a separate thing, it doesn't really matter um, whether, you know, well A1 and well A2 are run by the same exact uh, CPU or not. But if I return to my time-lapse movie, um, if I want to track objects through time, it's pretty important that, you know, all of the frames of my time-lapse movie are being run in the same copy of Cell Profiler, but also that it doesn't try to link the objects into, you know, from movie one into movie two. And so groups is really critical for telling Cell Profiler, how does the data get put together? Um, so this is especially important when we're going to take the data and sort of spread it across lots of nodes in a cluster or in the cloud. Uh, I see we have a question. Um, uh, is headless mode overriding parameters specified in the pipeline? So if the output folder is specified, will the command line ignore it and use the folder you specify? It's a great question. So um, in the in the GUI, you can set default output folder and default input folder to something, but that's actually not saved to the pipeline. That's sort of local to your copy of Cell Profiler. Um, if so, in the context of an individual module like Save Images, um, default output folder is actually a variable, and it just says whatever I find as default output folder at runtime is what I'm going to use. Um, and so if you're running it in your GUI, it'll use whatever your GUI thinks to haul output folder is. If you're running it in a cluster, it'll be whatever your cluster has sort of set the default output folder is. Um, but if you are not using default output folder, if you've actually given it a specific path, um, it will still try and find that specific path. And that's why not setting, not setting hard-coded paths, as we sometimes call them, but just sort of saying, the variable default output folder or that um, folder with then a subfolder into it um, is, is really critical for your data ending up where you expect. So you can specify the temp directory for while you're running because Cell Profiler will make temp files. Um, you could put your output also into something like temp, but you have to make sure then that you get it out um, before you uh, before it gets deleted and overwritten by something else. But yeah, you can specify the temp directory. There's a lot of flags I'm not covering here, um, but there it, if you go to the link that's in the bottom of these slides, it'll uh, then send you to a, it will show you where the page is that has all the flags. <laughs> Why would you use uh, headless mode locally as opposed to on a cluster? You usually wouldn't. Um, and the reason for that is when you're running Cell Profiler in the GUI, um, Cell Profiler will automatically multi-thread. So if you have eight CPUs on your computer, it will run eight individual copies of Cell Profiler. Um, you can tell it to use fewer, but it will use as many as you let it use. Um, when you run headlessly, it will run one copy. Um, and so almost always, if you're running on a local machine, um, that will support using a GUI, um, you might as well use the GUI because it will have the advantage of it will handle multi-threading and how to sort of group all of your files without you needing to worry about that. Um, but um, you can run it headless locally if, for example, you had something where you were using something else that was using a lot of your graphical card and you didn't want to sort of bother creating the, the GUI interface. It'd be a pretty corner case though. It's one of those things that's possible, but not a, not usually a good idea. Um, the exception to that is if you were running it in a container like Docker locally, which I will get to in a few slides.
sorry, I don't know if there is any module that will create, will divide images in um, patches to be analyzed independently if you're running on a local machine, is there? Yep, um, so the save cropped objects module will allow you to save out objects into patches so that you can use them in a deep learning application later. Okay, thanks. But if instead you want to identify primary object and uh, start from an image, uh, would you need to divide the picture into multiple images with a macro before? Um, um, like if you wanted to run identify primary objects separately in sort of different parts of an image? Yes, if I imagine my image is mm -hmm. very, very huge and um, my computer will not do it. Um, yeah, so that's not possible yet, but that's something we're working on right now is um, how we can handle um, in the same way that say QPath does where you have a sort of large full slide image or something like that. Can we under the hood tile your image and then sort of um, break it down into tiles? Um, we're still sort of right in the middle of the weeds of that, but it's something that we know people want to do and we want to be able to support it. So you can load in a pyramidal file format, but it's just going to take the first tile um, for now. Subprofiler 5 is going to have a lot of improvements to file handling, including, again, we hope this sort of tiling under the hood and better access to what level of a pyramidal file. Um, yeah, so profile is almost 20 years old, so pyramidal formats are not something that was conceived of um, when it was created, um, but it's something that we're working hard to add because we know that more and more data is going this way. So yeah, this is why I, I just mentioned that grouping, um, which, you know, is when you're running on your local machine, usually sort of an afterthought with the exception of some cases like tracking or running a Z projection, um, really critical um, when you're setting up your pipeline to run headless. It's not totally mandatory, but it will make your life a lot simpler to do that. Um, so um, some folks on the team did a great um, blog post with associated um, video demo. Um, if you go to bird.io slash self profiler input, I also um, have linked to all of these slides at the end so you don't have to memorize all these links. Um, they will be provided to you in a PDF at the end. Um, but I would definitely recommend checking this out. Um, it's like five different people in my group who all put this together. It's really fabulous. Um, the other way, if you don't want to hassle with these four input modules and you're pretty comfortable scripting or you have access to some scripts that will do this sort of automatedly for you, um, uh, using a module called load data. So if you there's a uh, if you add the load data module to your cell profiler pipeline, it will actually deactivate these four input modules and replace it with itself instead. And with load data, what you can do is you can, um, rather than teaching cell profiler which files should be analyzed together, you know, what's the name of your DNA channel versus your mitochondrial channel, et cetera, if you're more comfortable just scripting all that information, you can just create a CSV file um, and load that into cell profiler. Um, and so your CSV file will end up looking something like this with file names and path names to where your images are, any metadata that you choose to include. Um, but otherwise, um, there's no sort of overhead of trying to sort of configure these, these input modules. You can also, um, when you tab such a CSV and load it into Cell Profiler, you can add grouping if you need to, or you can say only run rows one through 20 or anything else that you need to sort of subset this CSV. So if your data names are regularized and you're comfortable scripting, um, this can be a sort of a, a faster way to sort of do this sort of input bookkeeping than the actual modules. So the last thing is just, uh, or so input um, and telling it which files is going to look slightly differently depending on which of these input modules you've used. Um, if you're using load data, um, you pass in a dash dash data file with the path to where your CSV is. Um, if you're using the input modules and the CP pipe file, uh, you have a couple of different options. You can um, make a text file that's a list of all of the files you want cell profiler to think about and pass in dash dash file list with a thing to a text file. Um, but if that sounds like too much work and if the you have your files that you want to analyze all together in a single folder, you can just pass dash dash i path to folder and cell profiler will consider all of the images in that folder. Um, maybe not great if you have lots of other things in that folder as well, but it can be really handy so that you don't have to worry about setting up um, a file like this or a file like this. 
Um, and if you're using a batch file, because with the batch file, you already went in and said, you know, here's the data I want you to run and here's where on my headless machine you can expect to find it, you don't actually need to put anything in input at all because that's encoded in your .h5 batch file that you passed in in the pipeline. And then the last thing is how to group. Um, like, uh, like we've talked about now, um, the cell profiler, when you run it headlessly, is only going to run one copy. Um, and in general, you want uh, your data, if it's big enough that you're thinking about running headlessly, you want lots of copies of cell profiler. Um, so you need to actually let it know how to group it or what copies should be running specific things. Um, so some workflows like tracking require specific groupings, um, which you're typically going to want to use some metadata to specify. Um, but otherwise, um, you know, setting up grouping as part of your pipeline allows parallelization um, rather than a small number of CPUs, each running thousands of files, thousands run small numbers of files. Um, this is faster in terms of sort of calendar time, the time from when, you know, your data run starts to when your data run stops, but also, you know, not that cell profiler would ever crash, um, but if it would, if it happened to, um, if it crashes, you know, partway through a huge run, you might lose some or all of your quantitative data, depending on how you've structured your outputs. Um, and so running many copies of cell profiler, each of which has only a few files to run, um, vastly decreases sort of the likelihood that a crash will happen or sort of the pain of what's going to need to be recreated if a crash does. Um, so you can choose to group by a piece of metadata. So if you've set that, you know, your data is in a multi-well plate and it has wells, you can pass a dash G flag and say, um, this copy of cell profiler should run well A1 and the next one should run well A2 and so on and so forth. Um, you can also group by image set count. So if it doesn't really matter how your data is sort of scattered across all your CPUs, you just want it scattered. Um, you can say this one run files one through 10, this one run files 11 through 20, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so uh, you can either sort of create these yourself with scripts, or if you're using these handy batch files, um, you can tell it to actually print the groups present as well as like the command that your cluster should use. So you can essentially get all of your uh, commands. Um, and then just sort of dump those into a file and send them to your scheduler. Um, or you can, um, if you point at a batch file, um, point at the batch file with a flag called images per batch and tell it you want 10 images per batch. And it will, again, create all of the commands um, that your cluster is going to eventually need in order to do this. So it's not unpainful because you do need to figure out what the groupings are going to be yourself, but we've tried to make that straightforward for you. Now that you understand that cell profiler is the thing that can be run headlessly and what information cell profiler needs to run headless, where are you going to do this? How are you going to do this? Um, I haven't even put your local machine here because realistically, as somebody pointed out earlier, you don't actually want to do that. Um, so your local cluster might have an installation of cell profiler. Um, so profiler three and below run Python two, which is past end of life and therefore might be a security risk. So we definitely recommend something in the cell profiler four family. Um, you generate execution commands for the job in question. Um, and I've shown you some tools about sort of how to do that. And then you put it into your cluster submission system, which um, everybody's cluster works a little bit differently. So unfortunately, I can't give you exact um, things here. The pros, it's local. It's probably free. Um, so you don't need to move the data anywhere special, and it probably isn't going to cost you any money. Um, it depends, though, on your local bandwidth. So if you don't have a cluster or your cluster is typically way oversubscribed, you might be waiting a long time for your jobs to run. Um, and you're probably going to need to work with your local IT department. Most local IT departments are lovely. Not 100% of them are. Um, and installation should be smooth um, in sort of relatively up-to-date versions of, of Linux and Python. You should just pip install cell profiler and it should work. Um, but I can't promise that that's going to be how it goes 100% of the time. Um, and it's hard to support multiple cell profiler versions. So realistically, if you have a workflow that your lab has been running for 10 years in cell profiler three, and you need to make sure your data matches that, um, your cluster has to support cell profiler three, and then somebody else is using cell profiler 4.0, and some units using 4.1. 
um, sort of a nightmare for your IT department. Um, so that's why in general, we recommend containerization and all of the rest of the solutions I'm gonna show you um, take advantage of containerization. Um, so if you're not familiar with this concept, essentially um, a software containers such as Docker and Singularity um, are essentially an operating system in a box. Um, and the person who creates the Docker container sets up a specification file that installs things once and only once. And then you use this forever after, and you'll be guaranteed that when you use Subprofiler 424 in a Docker, it's the same one that when this person runs Subprofiler 424 in a Docker, it behaves the same way, um, and that it won't change. Um, you can usually use it anywhere. And so if you have, for example, a Mac or a PC, you can still run a container that runs Linux. I've put an asterisk here because as M1 and other sort of CPU architectures are becoming more common, this is getting kind of dicey in a few places, but hopefully it's going to get figured out. Um, it typically involves some code to run. Um, many containers haven't um, put the GUIs for the software inside the container or that you just have to know how to actually get to that GUI. So it's not, you know, the best solution for everything. Um, but there are already a tremendous amount of them available. Um, BioContainers has more than a thousand different um, biological softwares with that are Dockerized. Um, and somebody brought this up before. Um, the two major flavors of containers you'll typically see are Docker and Singularity. Um, developers prefer Docker because they're easier to develop and you can have a lot more permissions for installing things. Um, your local IT department doesn't like Docker because it gives you lots of permissions for installing things. Um, and so they have to give you a lot of permission in order to run Docker containers. Um, so typically a lot of, uh, especially academic clusters nowadays are running Singularity rather than Docker. Um, but Singularity can run most Docker containers. So for example, cell profiler we provide as a Docker, but you can in Singularity take a cell profiler Docker container and just run it. You don't need to do anything special. It will just run. So containerization is the solution to a lot of problems. So you can run cell profiler in Docker, um, which you could do this locally. You could do it on your cluster or you can do it somewhere in the cloud. Um, you don't have to memorize this, but um, this is what it would look like to do this. Um, this is just taken from our test suite for when we build our cell profiler Dockers. Um, the first line here says Docker, run a container. Um, the second and third line say, um, where, where, what should I mount as the input, aka where my file in, image file is gonna be. Um, and the output, where should my files end up on my local machine outside the Docker? Um, because in general, um, Docker only understands what's going on inside it. So you have to actually tell it how to access files on your operating system rather than its sort of containerized box operating system. Um, you then call a particular version of Cell Profiler, and we have everything from Cell Profiler 2.3 through um, what always our latest release. Um, and this last one should look pretty familiar. Um, it's just the same headless command that you saw before and any other flags that you want to put on here. Um, so this makes it really straightforward to sort of switch versions, to run it anywhere, um, to have a single command that will work in a lot of places. Um, you guys are going to do Galaxy next time, so I'm not going to go much into Galaxy, um, but just to sort of say, um, Galaxy is um, an easy to use way for end users um, to put a GUI onto an analysis and to make that analysis shareable and reproducible. It's really powerful. It's really cool. You're going to talk a lot about that next week, so I'm not going to go into a lot of the details. Um, and basically anything that is a container can be run on Galaxy um, if somebody sets it up, which is the, the issue with you know, running some things on Galaxy is somebody needs to actually go in and make an XML file that wraps the analysis and tells um, and tells um, Cell Profiler how it wants it to run. And um, depending on how this XML file is set up, um, some of these nice flags that we've talked about may not be accessible. So for example, the, the installations of Galaxy that exist right now, although my team is working on uh, working with some folks at Galaxy to make some better ones, um, you can't actually run any grouping flags. Um, so you're only running Cell Profiler on your whole data set without any groupings, one thing at a time. Um, 
Galaxy has a concept called collections, which you could then use to, to sort of try and scatter things that way. Um, but there's going to need to be some stuff that you do to set it up so that cell profiler can actually run efficiently. Um, the other issue, again, may also just be bandwidth because um, Galaxy is not sort of one central place to run things. It's actually many, many, many smaller places to run things. Um, so the particular case, the particular instance of Galaxy you may want to run may be oversubscribed. Um, that being said, in terms of sort of making something reproducible and easy to use, it's hard to find something that's nicer than this. Um, so you can access um, cell profile of 319 or 421 in Galaxy. 319 should be able to run anything in the cell profile of 3 series, 421 pipelines for anything through 421. It should probably be able to run most 424 pipelines too, but it will sort of freak out and tell you, uh-oh, this is advanced, or this pipeline came from a version of cell profile more advanced than me. I'm not sure if it'll work. Um, Tara. So um, Terra is a thing that is um, primarily used a lot in sort of single cell sequencing and high content genomics work, um, but does support cell profiler as well. Um, it's made at the Bird Institute, which is my home institute, um, Google and Microsoft. And the idea is to be able to put a, a pretty uh, easy face on running things in Google Cloud. Um, you can keep your data in Google Cloud, or a couple of other cloud services as well, but the compute happens in Google. Um, it uses something called the workflow description language, which is sort of a standardized language for describing workflows um, to then be able to call essentially anything that's containerized or anything that you can teach, um, teach Terra how to install. Um, because your data is running in the cloud, bandwidth is never an issue. Um, Google, you are never going to use up all of the availability of Google Cloud. Um, and there are a lot of examples and tutorials, and um, the, the team has worked really hard in sort of making some, some nice things for that. But you're paying for it. Um, you can get $300 in credits when you first sign up for Terra, but if you then need, you know, $5,000 of worth of compute, $300 may not um, be so much. I should say, um, cell profiler running a 384 well plate in Terra in terms of like feature extraction is somewhere between five and $10. So $300 will actually get you pretty far, but it's not gonna necessarily cover everything you need forever. Um, the current implementations um, only support CP pipe, not batch files, and they don't support a lot of the sort of really helpful grouping strategies right now. Although again, folks are working on this. And again, you have to learn another workflow language. So here you have to learn um, Galaxy's particular flavor of XML. Here you have to learn um, something called Whittle. Um, and there's only so many spaces in the brain for learning things like that. Um, and so the last sort of wrapper I just want to give a shout out to um, is a, one that we made called Distributed Cell Profiler, which is a wrapper for Cell Profiler for Amazon Web Services. Again, this is a cloud, so it is not free, but it's also not bandwidth limited. Um, but you don't actually need to know how to code in order to do this. Um, you can, um, it will take care of making all the infrastructure, keeping track of all of the infrastructure. It will try to save you money wherever it can uh, and then shut everything down afterward. Um, because this is something that we make, basically anything you can do in cell profiler, all of the sort of grouping and batch files and things like that, we make sure are supported in distributed cell profiler too. Um, and this preprint just came out literally like yesterday, um, but we are extending this. Um, we've already extended this, this to tools like Fiji, um, but this sort of approach of being able to sort of easily containerize um, analyses and sort of scatter them across lots of different CPUs um, we think is useful. So if you're in a situation where, for whatever reason, you don't want to use your local cluster, or you don't want to use Galaxy, you want to use um, a paid cloud, um, we definitely recommend that you do this. And we've been using this um, distributed cell profiler for six years and at least half a petabyte of data. So it's it's pretty nicely uh, sort of bug, bug fixed at this point. Um, if you want to learn how to do this, um, image.sc um, is always going to be my answer for just about everything. Um, 
Uh, and you can see that, you know, we've got tons of groups that are on there that can help out with this stuff, but my team are all distributed cell profiler users and are sort of used to running cell profiler headlessly and can help out with stuff like that. Um, which that and my time are sponsored by um, the Center for Open Bioimage Analysis, aka COBA, um, which is an NIH funded center which allows us to work with biologists to um, solve their biological problems, um, do community engagement like writing tutorials, um, as well as developing new software. Um, so definitely reach out to us and check out our website if you're interested in learning more about what we do. There's lots of opportunities to sort of collaborate. Um, and then this, these are the folks in my lab and our sister lab, um, and the folks who have paid the money to do this. <laughs> um, so distributed cell profiler basically involves running four Python commands, which are sort of here at the bottom. And again, you can download these slides and take a look at them yourself. Um, the first one, um, and of course my connection dropped, come on, come back. I was trying to be all slick and get it set up before you guys got here and then my connection dropped. Um, so I'm just, I'm SSHing into a machine that's running on Amazon. I don't need to do this, but the part of distributed cell profile that essentially acts as a babysitter and keeps an eye on things and shuts things down. Um, if that's running on your local machine, oh crud, the machine turned itself off. Um, if that's running on your local machine, then you, um, your local machine needs to stay on and stay connected or the babysitter goes away. Um, so typically we recommend that you run this in a sort of tiny inexpensive machine. I think this machine's like five cents an hour or something like that. Um, um, and you can see it has an alarm on it to turn it off so that when nobody's using it, it stops running and stops spending money except for when you wanted it to stay running during your demo. Um, but we, we built in a lot of instruction on how to run this on sort of an academic budget. Um, come on. Um, so there's a configuration file um, that we give you guidance on how to configure, but basically what you just tell distributed cell profiler is what to name the run so that you can take a look at the log that it's generating, um, what version of cell profiler to use, um, how many machines you want, um, what kind of machines do you want, how much are you willing to pay for those machines, um, and then if there aren't any available at that price, it will just wait until there are some. Um, and then some more information about sort of the size and sort of compute requirements. And so you can run way bigger jobs with distributed cell profiler taking advantage of really big machines that you wouldn't be able to necessarily run on your laptop. So we've used this to do sort of large tissue um, things that uh, otherwise cell profiler is a little too memory hungry to hand handle. Uh, So I'm just going to run a setup command. The setup command is going to read everything that I pre-filled in that configuration file, and it's going to make some infrastructure. So it's going to make um, a queue for me to put the list of things that I want to do um, in. Um, it's then going to also set up a cluster for me. If I don't already have a cluster, it will make one. Um, and it will give that cluster what's called a task definition, which is it will tell it um, how to act, what Docker containers to run, how to sort of put Docker containers onto uh, virtual machines, all of that good stuff. Uh, and this has a 60 second sort of thing in it because it needs to check that something worked, um, which is always great in a live demo. Um, but yes, if you want to know more about how sort of in general these things work and how to build your own version, um, this is the, the preprint that uh, just came out this week. Um, so the next thing to do is to tell Cell Profiler what jobs to do. And so um, we, we have here a script that sort of helps you automate that if your data is sort of regularly structured, such as in a multi-well plate. Um, if you give it the name of the pipeline and you tell it how you want things grouped. So in this case, we have it pre-set up um, for you know, grouping things by say plate well and site. 
um, this is sort of preset for you, although you can do any configuration of metadata and any sort of scattering that you want. That's just something that helps make it a little bit easier. Um, what? Um, oh, I probably named the queue incorrectly, didn't I? Um, live demos, guys. Um, okay. Um, I have, I forgot to specify what job we're doing. Um, and so this is set up for a, two di a few different common um, workflows. Um, I'm really selling the whole easy to use thing here, aren't I? Um, as I sort of insufficiently caffeinated try to run this on the fly. There we go. Um, so it's now submitted. In this case, we have a workflow where we want things for every um, for every well of a multi-well plate. And so I can just um, show you that here is one job. This is the job for well C9 in this particular plate, but um, my job my queue has uh, 96 jobs in it um, that are ready to be run. I'm now requesting a fleet of 48 machines to run those jobs. And of course it's throwing an error because this is a live demo. Um, usually this just works guys, I promise. <laughs> um, what is the error that you're upset about? Um, in any case, um, uh, once that has finished, um, that's not going to start for some reason. Um, but um, the, the steps that I've run so far have made um, a babysitting file that I can use that will keep an eye on the jobs that are there um, and shut this whole thing down when it's done. Um, I apologize for all the errors in the demo. Again, I swear usually um, this just works, but um, it makes it very straightforward to yeah, start running um, self-profiler jobs as big as you want and as many as you want um, with just a couple minutes of configuration. This is a bit of a classic for uh, Nebias uh, uh, workflows. It's uh, also been published as a as a workflow in the in the book. I put a link to the PDF of the book here, so you can just download it if you if you want. And what I'll do first of all is I'll share the link to the uh, to the to the notebook and if you don't mind or if you like and you want to follow along you can just uh, click on uh, click on that link and that will bring you to um to to this and then you can save a copy to your own drive um in um by going on the file menu and save a copy in drive so that you can modify it and run it in uh, at your own pace we don't need any fancy um, GPUs for this workflow. And so the, the advantage is that, you know, even if you get assigned to a CPU, it should it should work. Uh, it should work fine. Uh, you can also download a copy of your um, of the of the notebook here, and you can run it in your own uh, favorite environment. Um, there are a number of packages that are installed as part of this, um, but that's done, you know, in this in this part here, so so um, yeah, I mean this is an interesting uh, workflow because it show showcases a few uh, pieces which are useful in um, many different image analysis workflows. 
um, like spot detection is quite a common thing. You're trying to look at um, you know things that are bright uh, over a dark background or sometimes dark on a, on a bright background. Um, tracking uh, would take essentially those spots and connect uh, successive frames over time. That's also uh, quite a, a common thing. Uh, directionality analysis is something that um, uh, I haven't encountered that much in my, my experience, but it is an interesting um, way to analyze the tracks and this particular uh, workflow actually uh, um, showcases an example of that. And then um, it also touches on Gaussian mixture models um, as just as a way of, um, of trying to find out what are the two most likely um, distribution of uh, data points if if uh, if we were to model them as a mixture of of, of Gaussians? So um, all of the units in this case are in pixels or frames. Um, the um, the uh, that just makes things um, things easier. We're looking at directionality, so the scaling is not is not as important in this uh, case. Of course, if you're looking at distances or you're trying to uh, measure uh, velocity or things like that, then the units are um, are really important. But for our case, we're looking at directionality, and that's likely um, a dimensionless um, feature. Um, the um, you can in principle change this um, this URL to any image that you like. Um, in this case, we're just using the one that was used for the uh, for the book. And uh, but in any case, you can you can switch it off and uh, switch it out switch it out to any other any other image that you like. Um, so um, to open, you can also open it up in Fiji. I have it pre-opened here just because it takes a bit over the network. But you can basically select the URL and drag it onto uh, Fiji, and that will initiate the the download. I already did this, and so this is the image that we will be working with. And as you see, it's the time series, and we have essentially growth of microtubules, and they're kind of um, uh, going in all different directions. And what we're trying to find out is what a, a, uh, what are the quantifiable characteristics of the movement of these uh, of these uh, uh, growth directions. Um, there are a couple of parameters also that you can play with. Uh, these are the ones that I've used for the for the for this particular notebook, but it's interesting to try and um, try and modify these parameters and and see what uh, what the effect is, right? Um, and then this is um, uh, the figure size that's just basically um, just for visual uh, visual purposes. There's not anything in particular. Uh, there are a couple of more parameters here. Uh, this must be, I didn't catch this error, but essentially there's a couple of parameters here that you can modify. That doesn't seem to pop up before. So I'll, I'll modify that after the, after the class. Now there's a few libraries uh, which um, we're depending on. The original workflow had um, combined different software together. So it was um, uh, the tracking was done in Fiji. And then uh, the track information was exported and then imported into um, either R or MATLAB. In this case, um, that's one of the nice things about Python is that there is a large number of libraries available and and we can do everything in a single in a single place. So uh, MATLAB, uh, you know, PyPlot is just a, a plotting library. Uh, Scikit image contains a lot of um, interesting and um, image processing uh, routines. Um, NumPy is a kind of a must to learn in the um, kind of the Python data science world. I, I'm sure you've encountered it before if you've ever um, worked with Python in 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 this context. And um, and pandas is the uh, um, is the um, uh, pandas is the uh, is a library to manipulate tables essentially and do some uh, statistics and and does uh, and has some very um, nice expressiveness features um, in terms of like um, grouping parts of the table together, calculating some statistics, and um, doing things that otherwise you would use packages like R or other statistical um, software packages. 
And then there are a couple of other packages. Then uh, this one is to add uh, scale bars to the uh, to the image, but this one here um, is just so that I could put the Greek leg letter on the matplotlib, and and it is one of the the ones that takes longest to to install. Uh, so it's not super um, crucial, but uh, yeah, it it doesn't take a long time to install either. So in any case, I definitely go through and uh, execute the first one. And then um, we will execute the, the install. And if you, if you like, you can do the same in the copy of the, of the um, uh, notebook that you have. And so this is just installing a bunch of, um, the LaTeX package is quite uh, large um, um, and, and also quite powerful, as you might know, anyone who's written you know, articles in LaTeX, you know, will we'll know this is this is what's uh, uh, it's quite a quite a hefty package. And then this one here is a trackpy. So trackpy is a package for um, performing tracking, and we need the latest version. And I'm because it's in a still in development phase. I essentially downloaded the a specific version from GitHub and ins installed that just because um, if there were, you know, changed overnight and breaking changes to the API, uh, that would uh, mess up with the, with the work. Um, so this is, all, you know, this is something that you can always do is install a package by getting the URL of a specific zipped version of a, of a, of a um, release. So it's finished, it takes about a minute, so not too, not too bad. And this is just uh, to tell the plotting engine that we're you know, keeping the fixture size and also we would like to have um, uh, LaTeX. And then this one is reading actually the image from, uh, from that um, S3 uh, bucket. Um, we can verify that it's actually loaded. Um, and when you load up an image, the first is actually the number of frames, and then this is the, the other two um, X and Y dimensions. Uh, I just put a little warning here. If you're trying with your own image, we're expecting a 2D plus T image. And so if it's not three-dimensional image, it's going to throw up an error. Um, and this is a, just a little snippet to show the first and the last frame of the images to, to make sure that um, we can we can read the image. There's nothing super um, fancy about this. Um, if you've never encountered like if you're from coming from MATLAB, for example, um, this would be equivalent to the end. So we are indexing the um, 3D array with. Uh, with a minus one that indicates the, the last the last element. So now the first thing that helps is um, to enhance uh, those features that we want to detect. And this is a classic way of doing it. Um, so this particular method called the uh, difference of Gaussians uh, takes the difference between um, an image filtered with a small kernel and an image uh, filtered with a large kernel. What that means is like a slightly blurred image minus a very blurred image, a very blurred copy of the image. Uh, what that does is it essentially smooths out anything which is above what we're trying to look for. And <clears throat> it smooths anything below the size that we're trying to, um, that we're trying to detect. And so these, uh, the first sigma should be you know, smaller than the smallest feature you're trying to detect, and they should be larger than the largest uh, feature that you're trying to detect. Uh, luckily, um, scikit image has a function to do the uh, difference of Gaussians, and so we just use that. And um, and this one is um, this one is a. I mean, there's many ways of doing this, but what this does is essentially taking the difference of Gaussians of the image with those uh, small and large parameters, which we specified at the start of the notebook. And then it iterates through all of the uh, frames in the image and applies that difference of Gaussian function, puts it in a list, this is this parenthesis here. And then this one essentially uh, compacts all of those into a single, uh, into a single stack. 
And uh, oops, I didn't execute this. And this is the result, for example, of the first uh, of the first um, frame after uh, going through the difference of Gaussians. Now, look at the intensity. So we have the 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 color bar here to help us identify what the intensity levels are. And you see that zero is about at this, at this level here. Now we have things that are darker than zero, and these are these spots over here, these are darker than zero. And that's because, um, of course, when we take the difference of two things, uh, if, the, um, um, if the second element is, is larger than the first, then we get negative numbers. In this case, it's it's okay because um, the spot detection algorithm is not going to worry. We're looking at peaks of information, you know, something that that is um, there's a peak in it, so it doesn't matter like the app if the absolute floor of the image is is above or below zero. We're looking at differences in intensities, but this enhances like spot-like structures like here, and also gets rid of this um, kind of this uh, varying background that you can that you can see um, over here. So, and then uh, we have the track pie, and this is, um, um, this is the, 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 the library that we imported at the start. And so it's uh, the locate function is the one that performs the spot detection. And we're just gonna do it on the first frame. And we're specifying the typical size, which in this case was set to 11. It needs to be an odd number. And that's why it, uh, it's 11 and not 10 just the way of the, how the algorithm is implemented. And so that should be quite fast. There it finds the 338 spots and it calculates eight features from it. And we can have a look at uh, the table here. Uh, we've got the XY position, um, mass, we've got the size, eccentricity, um, how much is, you know, what's the signal level in, the, in that spot and then some additional um, metrics, which are uh, closer to the raw data. Thomas, um, so, sorry. yes. Can you specify about the mass measurement? Yeah. What is meant here? So the mass is the uh, integrated, uh, usually defined as the integrated intensity over the, over the spot. So okay. uh, if you would, you can think of it as the, as so the, the equivalent um, of image a integrate density, the sum of that's right. the pixel values. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So let's have a look at how those detected spots look like in the image. And it has a function that uh, essentially annotates an image. So it's you know, quite easy to, to, uh, uh, to look at the results. And we can see, we can see in fact that there are a number of places where the I, the spot is very weak, and we're maybe not that interested in in, um, in keeping those spots. So we'd rather keep the ones that you know are kind of a, a brighter intensity. And so, what can we do to uh, kind of filter those out? Well, first, let's look at what are the features that have been calculated, which are essentially the headers of this uh, table here. And then we can make a list of these um, where we take away the X and the Y. And so this is a, a Python notation for, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the sets, but these are essentially groups of elements without duplication. So in this case, uh, we have the, the list of all of the headers. And then um, in this case, we just take away the X and Y and you can take a difference between sets and that as the as intuitively uh, you can uh, you can think of this as taking away the x and the y from those uh, uh, from the list of of potential columns. So um, the result is a set. You can see it's a set because it's um, it has these uh, curly brackets on on either side. And then what we're going to use this is basically to automatically generate a histogram for each one of those. And so. Um, I just turn off the uh, LaTeX because it was uh, messing up with these special characters here. And then I'm going to create um, a series of one of a one row with um, 
a number of uh, plots, which is the length of this uh, set, and like specify hard, you know, hard code uh, um, a figure size just to keep everything in proportion. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to use this special Python function called enumerate, which basically takes a list or a set or any terrible uh, variable, and then returns uh, two values. One is the um, an index into that uh, uh, iterable thing, and um, and the actual element from the from the list. So I would be zero, one, two, three, four, five, and the M is going to be EP Roma sigma size X and S. And so we take the ith axis that I've you know that I've created here, and then create a histogram, essentially with the um, with the uh, uh, I'm taking the table and I'm taking the column that has that particular name. And then I also set the title, of course, of that um, of that element. So if you do this again, there, you can see the result already there, but you know, just to prove that it works. And so there's nothing really there that stands out uh, the, as a criterion. You know, there's this, there's something here in the signal, so we could use we could definitely use that. Um, in this case, I've chosen to look at the size and the mass against each other and, and try to see if there's any, any pattern. When you break those two apart, you know, you're basically showing the scatter plot of all of the, all, all of the uh, spots um, plotted by size and mass. You can see that actually, if you take the mass, there is, seems to be kind of a concentration of the spots which have a very low uh, mass. And so when what we can do then is try to see if, if we isolated only the spots that have a mass above one, what would the detection look like? And so you can do that here with the annotate function. You just take the, uh, the table of spots, the image, uh, which is the first frame in this case. Um, you, you say that you want to split it by category um, using the mass column, and that you want to use one as the threshold and that you want to plot one in, um, in red, the ones that are below the threshold, and in green, the ones that are above the threshold. And you can see that this uh, it kind, of, kind of nicely separates out the ones that, that have a, a strong uh, mass. And so this looks like a reasonable um, number to try out for, the, for detect detection. So at that point, then we can uh, we can run the look, uh, you know, the localization on the entire um, on the entire set, and that's uh, quite um, uh, well. This is for the first one, so it's just for the first one, just to check that everything is um, is um, is in in check, right? Um, so essentially, it's saying that the minimum mass is one and perform the location on the first frame and then show us the result of that. And we get the same image as before, so that's good. And now we can perform everything. Um, we can perform the spot localization on the entire um, uh, video. It's quite quick. Um, even on a, a shared a node like this, it takes, you know, yeah, it says it takes three seconds, so it's quite, quite quick to do the, 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 the spot detection. So at this point, we have uh, all of the spots in a single in a single table. In this case, what we're trying to do is really trying to identify a good number of these uh, right spots in such a way that we can then perform tracking on them. Um, so even if we don't um, get absolutely all of the spots, um, we what we're trying to get is enough so that we can relate successive, uh, the, the same spot in, in successive frames in such a way that then we can calculate the, you know, the displacement vectors. So in this particular case, I, I didn't you know, try and um, fine tune the parameters and you know, really dug deep, dig deep into uh, if, if each one of the spots were, uh, was identified correctly. But in this case, it was like more of a, uh, we have enough spots to be able to calculate statistics on the on the movement, but um, I, I'm not aware of any um, specific comparison between TrackPy and and the TrackMate. Um, but there is um, there has been a um, a tracking challenge a couple of uh, a few years ago now, 
and um, that was a systematic uh, comparison of of many different tracking algorithms. Okay, so in this case, uh, it says here it's using an implementation of the Crocker Crayer linking algorithm. So I'm not sure if that's the same that TrackPy uh, that TrackPy uses. But I'll also include um, this in the in the chat if everyone wants to kind of dive deeper into into okay. that. Thank you very much. So then in this, um, so in the next section, what we're going to do is we're going to get all of the spots that we that we um, identified and try and link them together so that um, you essentially um, um, try to identify if if you have two spots in successive frames, do these belong to the same track or not? And that's where that algorithm that um, that um, I put in the chat comes into comes into play. So it's an important an important step. Um, there is a description of how um, a trackmate does this in in the in the book chapter, and so I'd encourage you to have a look at at, at that um, at that uh, chapter too as a kind of background information or additional information. So in this case, then we have a new table. Um, we get again the most of the information we had from the spot, but now we have two additional columns. One has the frame where that spot appears in, and the particle, which is uh, now an identifier of which track essentially it belongs to. And we can also plot all of the trajectories together on the image, just to have a look if uh, the kind of a sanity uh, smoke test, if you like, um, to see if the tracks look, uh, um, uh, look reasonable. And, um, this little thing here hides what um, in Fiji you would do through the um, minimum projection. So yeah, you can go here, go stack, Z project, and get the minimum projection. And that's essentially what this image looks like. So you're taking, and it works for um, any like 3D matrix. So this is an interesting one. So you're essentially taking the stack um, saying, I want to take the minimum across axis um, um, zero, which in this case is time. You remember that the first um, index was, was time. So you're taking the minimum in time of the intensity. And this is just to give kind of a dark-ish background uh, to, the, uh, to the track image that also kind of hints at what, where the structure is. Um, that's it, and then it plots all of the trajectories. So it's um, you know, quite a convenient um, um, API, and uh, that's all, all, really all there is to uh, the tracking step. Uh, it's uh, really a very, a very quick, um, a very quick um, operation. There are a couple of parameters that you can um, uh, tweak, and one of them comes into play. Oh, actually, two of them are, are specified here. One is the search range, uh, which essentially tells you how far you expect from one frame to the next a particle to move. And then in this case, it's set to five, uh, five pixels. And this is an important parameter. So if you if you put if it's too large, then it kind of brings together, it might risk to bring together tracks which don't belong um, uh, together. Um, and um, and it really depends on on kind of the velocity of your of your particles. If your particles don't change uh, position much between successive frames, then you can keep this um, this search range um, low. Um, memory is um, there are similar parameters in TrackMate. Maybe if I have TrackMate up here, I could also show how that would work. Let's see if it's here. If I don't have it, then never mind. Let's see if I have it here. So there, there are analogous parameters in in TrackMate, and um, it's. Um, 
So if we go on to the detection, Lagrange of Gaussian, there you see the DOG detector. So we could actually use something which is uh, um, similar to this. So the, the link max distance is essentially the search range. And then uh, the memory parameter would correspond to the uh, gap closing max frame gap. In this case, it's two as a, as, a, as a parameter. So this is just in case you wanted to kind of have a feel of how the two work um, against each other. You can always um, pop this one up and, and try it on, on tracking. And this part is admittedly the one that is um, the one that you would, well, it's an interesting, the most interesting part of this, uh, uh, of this uh, workflow, which is the analysis of the directionality. And so um, we're going to look at what is the largest, uh, what's the longest track. Um, to do this, we can take the table of uh, tracks, um, uh, get the particle uh, column here, and just take um, uh, how many of, uh, how many spots have that ID. And so the longest one in this case is uh, 230. And yeah, of course, but because I did it before, I know it's 230. And but you get, if you get another value, it's easy to you know to set a different one here. So what this is going to do is just to filter out the the spot table just by taking that that single track out, and the reset index is needed um, just to make sure that the um, that the index is is um, goes well, from zero to in this case uh, 71. So then uh, we just plot the x and y positions, and this is how a single track looks like. This is the longest, uh, the longest track. Now to get the average direction, uh, we could take the individual vectors and then um, and then we take take the average of those. Um, but you will notice, and there's a discussion in the book, and, and a point uh, per se, that particularly to a figure, um, you know, six point eight. Actually, I might. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the, the the book so that we have it we have it here, and so that we can actually look at that particular figure I was uh, mentioning. There, this one here. So essentially, if you take the average displacement of these three vectors, it's essentially the um, it it is essentially the difference between the left. If you sum these three vectors up, it's essentially the difference between the coordinates of this point and the original point. And if you want the average direction, it's essentially dividing the difference between the last and the first, and then dividing it by the number of of steps. That's basically what what I was um, uh, what I was referring to. But this is a a visual. Of, uh, of that same concept. So back to our uh, tracking side. So for example, if we take the displacement for the longest track, we just take the last element. That's how, this is how, how you would express that in, uh, uh, or one way to express that. And then uh, the same for the Y. And so it tells you that it's, 20 pixels in X and, and minus 41 in, in Y. So we can do that for all of the particles. And this is where the expressiveness of pandas comes into play. So we take the tracks table. We just take these few columns that we need. And then we're going to group the table by the particle ID. So this means that it's basically going to group it track by track, right? And it's going to, it's like splitting it up in many different tables with, um, um, with the particle IDs uh, as the split criteria. And then we do this function, the aggregate function, uh, which essentially you can pass um, a single function and it will apply it to um, all of the subtables that it, that it creates. In this case, it's an anonymous function. Um, it's just a way of expressing like an expression, if you like. And so given x, it's going to uh, get the last minus the first of whatever thing that you express here. And it's going to apply it to all of the columns. So let's do that. 
and this is then um, exactly what it does. This is the difference between the last x coordinate and the first co x coordinate, uh, the last y coordinate and the first uh, y coordinate, and this is the number of, um, of particles, right? Because you get the last frame minus the first frame, or the length of the of the track, if you like. So there's a lot of them which are, you know, which we are not very interested in. And so what we can do is we can at least um, take the ones that are that have um, at least one uh, frame difference between the last and the first. So essentially excluding all of those where the spots were lonely and didn't find a, a, a companion uh, a companion spot. And we can double check if the calculations are correct. And yes, so this is the this is for a friend track 230. You can see that the differences are are the same. Now to the fun part, um, we can calculate the direction of this uh, vector. Um, to calculate directions, the um, function that is used both in MATLAB and actually they're named the same is a slightly modified version of the arc tangent. Um, so you know the, the arc tangent is the inverse function of the tangent. And so you give it, um, for the arc tangent, you would give it a ratio between y uh, divided by x, and that would give you back an angle. But when you do this ratio, you lose information of where, you know, where in the, or in the, in your, suppose you have the x here and the y is here, um, it loses information on, on, on what quadrant you, you're actually in. And so the angle only goes from zero to, to pi or from minus pi halves to pi halves. And so in this way with the atom two, it takes, you give it two arguments, the y and the x, and that gives it enough information to uh, calculate an angle which covers the entire uh, the entire plane. So to do that, we just take the first two columns here, and then we apply uh, the arctan um, two uh, function in um, in um, uh, giving it the y and the and the x coordinates. Now the uh, the length of the vector. That's quite easy. You know, you just take the, of course, uh, just the, the square of the displacement and you sum the square of the displacement in y, and then you take the square root, and that gives you the length essentially of that of that vector. Okay, so um, one of the interesting ways of looking at all of the directions now that we have all of the uh, all of the direction, we can plot them, and, um, and a good way to do this is to um, is to use the um, a polar plot, <clears throat> to I'm sure you're familiar with. Essentially, it's a it's a plot where um, you can identify points by by the uh, distance from the center and and an angle, and that's exactly what we calculated here. And so you get this uh, polar plot here. Now, in every uh, of course, in any scatter plot, um, one of the problems with scatter plots is that when points get denser. You don't you you know you kind of lose information and um, everything kind of gets smudged together, and so a better way to look at that is to look at the histogram in this case of the of the directions, and we can we can actually look at that and we can see that there's a very nice uh, you know bimodal distribution which essentially means that in our video, if I go back to this, um, in our video there most of the particles are either going up or down. And that's what's shown here. So now we can um, um, look. If you, for example, if you had an, an image and the directionality is not very clear, the profile is kind of, you know, something like this, you might be wondering if that's um, just random or if there is, a, if it's a uniform distribution across the, the angles. Or if it's uh, or if it actually shows um, a preference in directionality, and to do that you could just do a chi-squared test and compare it with the uniform distribution. And in the case of um, of Python, there's the SciPy stats module, which includes a chi-square uh, function. And in this case, it, if you don't give it any parameter, it's going to compare with the uh, null hypothesis, which is uh, essentially um, that each bin has exactly the same number of, of elements. So if you run this, you see that the p-value is very, very small, uh, which means that you discard the null hypothesis that it's uniform, 
and therefore you're saying it does have some kind of uh, shape that, that is not that is not uniform. Now the next part is um, seeing that we have kind of a bimodal distribution. One of the ways that you could um, kind of estimate the directions is to model it as a mixture of uh, two uh, Gaussian distributions. And so the scikit learn package now um, also has an implementation of the Gaussian mixture model, and we can just use it out of the box. And so uh, we would just import the corresponding package. Um, then the, the only parameter it has is that you have to decide a priori what, how many um, Gaussians are you expecting in your distribution? And so this little parameter here tells it um, how many you're actually, uh, you're, you're actually um, expecting. Now, this long paragraph here is because um, uh, we have to basically reshape the data in a way that it fits what uh, scikit-learn is expecting. We have a single vector of, of values, right? So you would say, you know, there isn't anything, there isn't much to do. But in um, because this uh, Gaussian mixture model can be applied to, um, uh, to, to data points, which may have many, many different features, right? Uh, so you, you can think of it, um, it's not just the angle, but you could have like the, you could put in the radius if you like. And so the, in this case, the Gaussians that you're trying to fit are not one dimensional Gaussians, you know, like this, but they're actually, you know, two dimensional Gaussians. And so the downside of that is that, um, or downside, the, the consequence is that you have to tell it if when you give it a single array, is that a single point with many, many features or is that a set of points with just one feature? And you do that by telling it the, you know, the shape of that. So it's essentially, a, you have to convert that 1D array into a 2D array, even if one of those dimensions is one. So in this case, we want everything to be in a single, um, in a single column. And so that's essentially what this is doing. You, you fix the number of columns here, you're reshaping it, you're fixing the number of columns to one, and then you're saying just, you know, just calculate the number of rows I, um, I don't mind here. And the nice thing of putting minus one here is that essentially if you change the number of spots, you don't have to manually uh, specify or calculate the number of, of rows that the, the output um, uh, means has. Once you do that, then it's just a, just a fit, you know? And then uh, what you do is you extract from that fit the estimated parameters, and in this case, it says that the estimated two angles are 1.6 and minus 1.45. So let's have a look how disease look like. So we're gonna plot the, the bar plot as a background. And then in front of it, we're gonna plot a stem plot where um, as X coordinates, we're gonna put the means, which is this one and this one. And as Y coordinates, we're just gonna put the maximum counts. So this fence is gonna go right up to the top here. I painted in red. And I forget what this parameter was here, but it's, it was needed in this case. Uh, this notation simply says, take this list here and uh, multiply it by two, meaning make it, make it, make it um, twice as long. So in this case, it's a single, um, I mean, another equivalent way, uh, but less um, nice to look at is to do this. And uh, this has exactly the same, the same meaning. Okay, good. Now we can convert those angles to um, to degrees, and there we have it. And at this point, we have the estimation of two of the two angles. Now you might be wondering, what's the confidence? How, how confident are we in the in the estimation? And so this last uh, step is essentially performing bootstrapping, with essentially random sampling on your list of uh, angles uh, repeatedly and calculating that estimation again and again, and to see what the variability of that estimation is. Uh, this is for repeatability, so I just fix the random number generator seed in the same way. So in this, in, in that means that if you try it and I try it, we both get the, the same the same result. What I'm doing here is just, I'm just defining a very simple function which takes a list of uh, angles and does the a Gaussian mix, mixture model fitting, and then returns the um, uh, the list of two means as a, as as two elements. So if I apply it on the entire list, I get the same result as above. Now what we're going to do is apply it 100 times 
uh, we take a copy of the of the of the angles. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to shuffle that, and then you're appending um, to like a, an empty list the list of uh, sorted angles that we get from the from the estimation. So we need to put the sorted here because there are two elements, and depending on how the algorithm is initialized, it may um, find that the first one is, is, is the minus 1.5 or the first one is the 1.6. So in this way, I'm just ensuring that they're you know, in, the same, in the same order. And after that, you just put everything into a single, into a single array. Okay, so at that point, we, have, we can find out things like the a confidence interval. Um, and we essentially take the, the upper 2.5 percentile and the lower 2%, 2.5 percentile, and we, we put those here. And so we, you can see that for the first angle, it goes from minus 1.45 to minus 1.44, and the second one, 1.64 to 1.65. Um, you could have the same in degrees. And so you can see that the estimation is really is quite tight. So for it, what, what that essentially means is that if you model that distribution with um, those two Gaussians, um, the dependency on the actual data points is, is quite low, and the estimation is, is pretty consistent. And um, that's it. This is just um, a visual representation. So if we take like the first angle, this is all of the all of the estimates that we got. Um, these are all of the means for the for the first angle, and you can see that they're quite tight even from minus 1.45 to minus 1.447. And for the second angle, 1.646 and 1.652. And so, um, yeah, so they're, they're pretty tight. And then you can also summarize this with a circular plot. And so this is essentially a bar plot, but with a polar um, Cartesian, you know, with a polar diagram as a background. And I did put this in the, as an exercise down here. Uh, to see um, how would things change if we used a different way of estimating those two uh, cluster of angles? Would how how would it change? And there's a snippet here that you can use and and paste at the appropriate locations in the code so that you can uh, you know you can see you can test the different ways of estimating those angles. Uh, looking at the chat there, where you were using at least three different software, you were using ImageF, if I'm correct, you were using MATLAB and R for mm -hmm. the statistical part. This is uh, really a success on how to integrate every part together in a workflow that runs just through Python. Um, now, you do this in Python uh, because this is compatible with Google Colab. Do you see the possibility of doing it in another programming language, you know, and run it still on the cloud? Like, would MATLAB be um, a good choice if you want to do things on cloud? I don't have experience personally, or other- I know there's a MATLAB online. So I think there's a way that you can run MATLAB code online. I'm, I haven't tried it much on, on my end. And some of the other commercial uh, packages like uh, Mathematica also, um, um, also has the option of running things online. So that would be certainly something interesting to try. Um, R, um, definitely you can run um, in the cloud. Uh, in fact, um, I'm not sure if in Colab, but in Jupyter, you can definitely specify R as a, as a language and you can, you can run R code in uh, you know in your notebooks if it's you know if it's configured um, uh, like in particular actually the beaker kernel allows you to switch languages in between a single a notebook so you can com combine even within the same Jupyter notebook you could combine um, like Java you could combine um, R uh, Python and other not not MATLAB of course but other other similar languages so definitely there is a possibility of using different ones. Um, and of course, I mean, with some work, you would be able to uh, create like a Fiji plugin, for example, to do all of this, but there's a lot of things that are um, kind of not best suited for uh, Fiji, like all of the plotting and the statistics. Those require some external libraries, and there might be some equivalent for Java, and I'm, I'm not aware for of, of, of many. So it's um, I'd say if you had to learn one to 
to, to do most of the things that you might encounter, at least from a coding perspective, then it's hard to find something that includes uh, everything like Python. And then again, uh, Julia might be, uh, you know, the next, uh, the next, um, the next Python, but uh, I haven't, I haven't tried to code all of this in, in, in Julia. Okay, thank you. And um, just you are aware, are there other libraries capable of doing fitting of multiple distribution other than Gaussian? Yes, I mean, uh, scikit-learn um, is essentially a very generic uh, machine learning library, and it does have a lot of clustering algorithms, and uh, and um, there's a, a number of different um, ways that you could do the same the same analysis that makes sense. In fact, uh, for the for the book, I uh, implemented a MATLAB uh, routine to um, which is called find circular modes which actually doesn't do fitting. What it does, it basically looks at, um, does basically peak detection on the, on the histogram. And that's, that's quite, that's a bit of a different approach, right? You're, you're, um, the, in fact, the results that you get are, are slightly different because you can see if um, what you're essentially looking for is the most common angle, right, the mode is the, the most common angle, and that corresponds to the peak of a histogram, right? But in the case of a Gaussian mixture model, what you're saying is that you, you have, you're assuming that there are two uh, normal distributions that are kind of mixed together, and therefore it works best um, whenever the two distributions are look like normal, right? And so that's, there, the, every, every little algorithm has its own, uh, has its own assumptions, and it's important to kind of be explicit and and also think about these um, in a in a way that is you know specific for your project. So um, it is definitely possible to use many different um, algorithms, and I, I put a couple there on the on the notebook just because I think they're interesting. But uh, um, and also key means is very generic too. It's also quite robust to uh, um, to initialization. So. Well, not robust to initialization, I should say. It's just a, it it tends to give um, a consistent result. So in this case, it would you would imagine uh, it's trying to find. If you, I don't know if you know how the k means. Uh, probably everyone does, but I'm just going to repeat it anyway. It's uh, you take two initial estimations, then you assign uh, each point to either one or the other cluster. Take the centroid, and and then. Um, of each one of the two clusters, and then repeat that estimation, and and until you have some kind of convergence, right? And so, um, in fact, uh, well, you, I'll, if you're curious, I'll, I'll encourage you, I'd encourage you to do the test again and try to see how how that looks like. I but if you want the um, the answer, feel free to contact me, and then I can I can say um, if they look uh, similar or not. <laughs> 